Hello everyone, a very good morning to you. It is seven o'clock and welcome to Sky News Breakfast. A four-day humanitarian truce has come into effect between Israel and Hamas with 50 Israeli hostages and 150 Palestinian prisoners expected to be released over the next few days. We'll be joined by Mel Stride, the Secretary for Work and Pensions. And we'll be asking if labour shortages here are pushing up net migration figures. It is Friday the 24th of November. Well, smoke is billowing over northern Gaza two hours after the temporary truce began. The priority will be freeing hostages and getting as much aid into Gaza as possible during the pause. But Israel has warned that this truce will not mean an end to the war. Buses and police cars are torched in Dublin after a stabbing outside a school left three children and a woman injured. A decade after killing his girlfriend on Valentine's Day, former South African Olympic gold medalist Oscar Pistorius is seeking another chance at early release. Nissan said to announce its commitment to making new electric car models in Sunderland, preserving thousands of jobs. Sab Kerr scores a brilliant hat-trick as Chelsea win in the Champions League group stages. And Great Britain have been knocked out of the Davis Cup tennis. They have been beaten in the quarterfinals by Novak Djokovic's Serbia. A very good morning to you. A temporary truce has come into effect in the Israel-Hamas war. It sets the stage for the exchange of hostages held in Gaza and Palestinians imprisoned in Israel. If it holds for the four days as planned, it will be the first significant break in fighting since Israel declared war on Hamas seven weeks ago in response to the terrorist group's attacks on October the 7th. Well, joining me now from Tel Aviv is our Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bunkel. And uh, Ali, the first question has to be about the smoke that we have seen uh, over parts of uh, Gaza. What's the latest? Well, in the hours leading up to the ceasefire, which is now two hours old, uh, the Israelis carried out a number of airstrikes in Gaza. It's not uncommon. We, we see a lot, whether it is wars between Israel and Hamas or elsewhere around the world, when you put a ceasefire in place, both sides use the minutes and the hours leading up to that appointed time to try and uh, push forward with their military advantage before uh, they are told and in order to hold their fire. What was, I think, quite significant is that we did not see a massive barrage of rockets from Hamas fired out of Gaza into Israel. That is what we would normally expect in conflicts between the two sides. And that might speak to Hamas's capabilities now and how much Israeli military have degraded their ability to fire rockets into Israel. Um, there was an air raid siren that warned at about quarter past seven local time, 50 minutes into the ceasefire, down near the southern Gazan border. The IDF have not, though, confirmed that any rockets were fired. It might have been a false alarm. Um, Ali, talk me through the sentiment over the last, let's say, 24 hours as this uh, ceasefire, this pause, uh, has been approaching. And, of course, after it was delayed, at least the, the exchange of... Uh, hostages for prisoners was delayed. Was there a sense that it was all about to fall apart or uh, is there really just a, a sort of sense uh, of celebration that anything at all is happening? I wouldn't go far to say celebration yet because people are uneasy. Uh, they know how fragile these ceasefires can be and until we see at the very least the first hostages released later on this afternoon, I think people in Israel and people in Gaza who have been living under seven weeks now of Israeli bombardment will be very, very cautious. They'll be holding their breath to see whether or not this ceasefire holds. Of course, though, deep down, there is a real expectation in Israel that finally uh, there is going to be some good news uh, coming out after the last seven weeks. There is a real hope that some of the hostages, we are in hostage uh, Freedom Square in the middle of Tel Aviv. This has been a permanent vigil uh, for many, many weeks now. And there is a real hope that some of the faces on the posters that you see around here by this evening and over the coming days will no longer be hostages, but instead they'll be freed. 
And, and Ali, I just uh, had one follow-up, which is obviously we've discussed at length the structure of this deal and the, the prospect that it could go on beyond four days if uh, more hostages continue to be released. We also discussed the extent to which Israel's government immediately agreed to the deal or, or really had to debate the pros and cons. Do you think Israelis and the government in particular will want it to be drawn out over a long period of time or, or is the focus really just down to any hostage life is, is worth pretty much anything? I think the Israelis will be content to extend it further if they can get guarantees from Hamas that more hostages will be released. So the, um, the offer, if I can put it like that, from Israel to Hamas is that if you provide us with uh, the names of 10 further hostages that you can release, we will then extend this truce by another 24 hours every time. So I think the Israelis, obviously one of their priorities is to get all of the hostages out. So if there's a real chance of doing that now that we're into the ceasefire, then I expect they would go for it. What they will want to avoid is Hamas using this time to try and string it out for many, many days without much result because they know that Hamas will use this opportunity to try and regroup and rearm and frankly pause for breath after what has been a relentless military campaign against them. But the Israelis have been very, very clear. They do not see this as the end of the war. I'm sure they will come under increasing international pressure during this truce to make it a more permanent or at least much longer than the four days that it's currently scheduled to be. But as far as the Israelis are concerned, they, are un they have unfinished business in Gaza and they expect to resume hostilities whenever the ceasefire comes to an end. Uh, Ali Bunkel, as always, thanks uh, so much for that. Uh, meanwhile, our international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn, has been looking more closely at the painstaking negotiations uh, that took place to bring us to this point and what could happen next. Their faces have stared out from posters for almost seven weeks in Tel Aviv's hostage plaza and far beyond. How many will we now see come home? In Qatar, the hostage mediators were sounding positive. We are hoping that that, that momentum will carry and that we would find uh, this would open the door for further and more uh, deep negotiations towards an end to, uh, to this uh, violence. They set out the details of the exchange. They will be 13 in number, all women and uh, children, and uh, those hostages who are from the same families will be uh, put together within the same patch. Obviously, every day will include a number of, uh, of civilians as agreed to total 50 within the four uh, days. British Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron became the latest visitor to Israel to be shown the aftermath of the October attacks in Kibbutz Beri, which saw some of the worst atrocities. Later meeting Israel's Prime Minister, he highlighted the plight of British people taken to Gaza that day. I hope everyone who's responsible behind this agreement can, can make it happen um, to bring relief to those families, including, of course, there are British nationals mm. who've been taken hostage. Um, and so that, let's hope that that can be delivered. For every Israeli hostage released from Gaza, three Palestinian prisoners will be let out of Israeli jails. Some sent home through this crossing into the West Bank, others to East Jerusalem. For Israelis, they're terrorists. To Palestinians, they're heroes of the resistance against Israel's occupation. I hope that all the prisoners will be released and that the resistance will succeed in freeing all the prisoners from Israeli prisons, as they honestly suffer from oppression and mistreatment by Israeli occupying forces. In Tel Aviv, a quieter day as people wait and hope the ceasefire will hold and bring back many of the missing. But relatives of male hostages know there's no chance this round will do anything for them. My son is not on the list. He's 46 years old and I hope that he is in a healthy situation that allows him to withstand all the hardship that is there, that they didn't wound him, didn't torture him and didn't do things that are inhuman. And I believe that he will handle that and will return healthy and in one piece. Even before the ceasefire, the mood here is subdued as Israel holds its breath. No one here is under much illusion that this truce can be anything but temporary. The government says it wants to obliterate Hamas and many Israelis expect it to try and do so. But before the war can resume in earnest, they hope there is the chance of bringing home the women and children. Dominic Waghorn, Sky News in Tel Aviv. And our man has died after a confrontation with police in East London. The Met says officers were contact contacted by uh, the man in Dagenham last night 
who said he was armed and threatening to take his own life. A negotiator tried to engage with the man before shots were fired by officers around 9 p.m. He died at the scene. The Independent Office of Police Conduct uh, is investigating. Now, buses and trams were torched uh, and a shop looted last night in Dublin after a stabbing outside a school that left three children and a woman injured. Let's go live to Ireland correspondent uh, Stephen Murphy. And, and Stephen, what can you tell us uh, about the trigger for all of this and, and the, the quite significant reaction? Well, there's a major cleanup operation this morning in Dublin city centre as the cost has counted from last night's writing, the likes of which I haven't seen in Dublin for many years. It was triggered, uh, as you put it, by an incident that took place right in the heart of the city centre outside a primary school at lunchtime when, uh, for reasons that are still unclear, still unknown, uh, a man attacked a group of people, including young children leaving that school, wielding a knife. He was tackled by bystanders. We spoke to some of them. They're brave Avery helped to bring that incident to an end as the emergency services arrived, but not before three young children received injuries. And particular, uh, one in particular, a five-year-old girl, remains in a very serious condition in hospital in Dublin uh, this morning. Now, that led to a lot of speculation online and angry protests over the nationality of the uh, chief suspect in this case. Demonstrations at the scene then escalated quite dramatically into full-scale rioting, and the guard the Irish police simply lost control of one of the main streets, O'Connell Street, the main thoroughfare through Dublin city centre for a number of hours. We were there, we witnessed double-decker buses being set on fire, a Garda vehicle being set on fire and widespread looting. One of the biggest department stores in Dublin, Arnott's, was looted. I saw a Foot Locker being looted, the Asics store being looted. This violence seemed to simply spiral out of control for at least a couple of hours before a number of baton charges down through O'Connell Street took place. We were told a number of arrests have been made. We don't know yet how many. And a number of police officers, uh, Gardaí here in Dublin, were injured. Around 400 were involved in the operation. We're at Garda headquarters here in Dublin. We're expecting to get an operational update on those figures a bit later on this morning from the Commissioner, Drew Harris. And he described this as a hooligan, lunatic faction driven by far-right ideology. Stephen, thanks so much. Now, the arduous process of forming a new governing coalition is beginning today in the Netherlands after far-right populist Gert Wilders' shock victory. With almost all votes counted, Mr Wilders' party for freedom is forecast to win 37 parliamentary seats, the highest tally. His election pledges including calling a referendum on the Netherlands' EU membership and a halt on accepting any asylum seekers. Uh, to put it in context, 150 seats in total, so some way off uh, his own majority. China says uh, no unusual or novel pathogens have been found among outbreaks of respiratory illness in the country's north. The government says data shared with the WHO, uh, the World Health Organization, suggest the spike is linked to the lifting of COVID restrictions as well as a common bacterial infection that mainly affects children. Amazon workers are staging a Black Friday strike at the online retailer's site in Coventry during one of the busiest shopping days of the year. Similar action is taking place elsewhere in Europe and uh, the US in long-running disputes over pay. Amazon says uh, customers won't be affected and insists its pay and conditions are fair. A crane worker involved in the dramatic rescue of a man from a burning building in Reading has described the ordeal as a close call. <clears throat> Excuse me. Glenn Edwards manoeuvred a cage in place, allowing the man to escape smoke and flames billowing around him. A second man was also rescued. Both were treated in a hospital for smoke inhalation. Some unbelievable pictures there yesterday. They are on the Sky News uh, website. <clears throat> Excuse me. Nissan is preparing to announce uh, later this morning that it will commit to making two new models of its best selling electric cars at its plant in Sunderland. Sky News understands the company's investment could be as much as £1.2 billion and will be supported by a contribution from the government. Well, in his autumn statement, Chancellor Jeremy Hunt said £4.5 billion would be made available to support strategic manufacturing sectors such as the car industry. Nissan's commitment to its Sunderland plant is expected to help preserve 6,000 jobs at the factory. Well, our business correspondent Paul Kelso joins me now on this story from uh, the plant in, correct, in question in Sunderland. And Paul, 
Uh, a big question, of course, is exactly what the government is doing to support this particular commitment. Uh, it's a company and a plant that has received government support before, straight after the Brexit uh, vote was announced and uh, Theresa May's government helped it. But nonetheless, it, it will be seen as a, a significant win for the government on uh, what has been quite an economic heavy week for them. Yeah, it's a further investment from Nissan. And the real story here this morning, well, I'm on the production line at the Sunderland plant. It's Britain's biggest ever car factory. These are Nissan Qashqai's, their left-hand drive. They're heading for the continent. A reminder, this plant makes cars that go all over Europe. The big story here is not just that there will be a commitment to make uh, the electric successors to this vehicle and the Nissan Juke, but there's a commitment this morning to build a third battery gigafactory that will provide the powertrains for these new vehicles. 18 months ago, Boris Johnson was here uh, to announce government support for Nissan's initial uh, gigafactory. Big investment on this site is being built at the moment. There's already a smaller battery factory making batteries for the Nissan Leaf. They committed 18 months ago to one factory. Today, a second gigafactory, three in total. Uh, they haven't said where it will be built uh, or indeed who will build it, but the partner for the existing battery factories is Envision, a Chinese-owned company. Uh, the total investment, £1.2 billion, they say, extra now, rising to £2 billion in total in due course. The usual rule of thumb about government support is around 10%, so we can, uh, we can speculate that between £100 and £200 million of the funding that Jeremy Hunt announced in his autumn statement to help uh, the automotive industry with the energy transition to low carbon sources will be heading here. Uh, we uh, got some words from the Prime Minister this morning. He says it's a massive vote of confidence in the UK automotive industry. And he says Sunderland is now the Silicon Valley of EV production. Of course, this is the Prime Minister who a couple of months ago delayed the phasing out of petrol and diesel engines by five years to 2035. The automotive industry, largely including Nissan, ignored him. They're sticking to 2030 as their deadline, and those electric vehicles and the batteries will be made here and in the UK. Paul Kelso, as always, uh, thanks uh, so much for that. We look forward to more coverage uh, from Paul throughout the day there uh, with a number of uh, key guests. Now, the Royal College of Nursing says there's a growing mental health crisis among nurses, including staff who are expressing suicidal thoughts. Uh, our correspondent, Shaman freeman Powers is here to, to break down these numbers. And, and Shaman, they, they are quite astonishing, the scale to which uh, suicidal thoughts are appearing in, in the nursing community. They are, and to put some of the figures into perspective, the Royal College of Nursing says that just last month in October, they had the equivalent of one person calling every working day, saying that they're experiencing suicidal thoughts on their initial call. That's compared to just one every week back in 2021. Stephen Jones, the interim head of the Royal College for Nursing Union, says that this should act as a frightening wake-up call to the government. He says that it's been long established that uh, nursing staff and other health professionals are more likely to experience suicidal thoughts because of the stresses in their day-to-day -day work, things like having to deal uh, with heavy workloads and also working extremely long hours. But they say adding to this is the fact that the NHS is understaffed. There are currently around 40,000 nursing vacancies in NHS England alone. And of course, millions of people also waiting on those backlogs for planned operations that continue to be cancelled or rescheduled. They're urging the government to put in place more mental health hubs that were in fact in place during the COVID pandemic as the government recognised mm -hmm. they were more likely to experience the, this stress. And they're also calling for the government to deal with this uh, backlog and the understaffing as well. We have had a statement from a spokesperson from the Department of Health and Social Care. They effectively say that they are hugely grateful for nursing staff and that their well-being is paramount but they say that NHS staff can access support and they point to those mental health hubs that I've just referred to as well adding that the NHS uh, is now working on uh, getting f around 50,000 nurses by next year. Well support's one thing but of course trying to rectify having the, the mental health issues and suicidal thoughts in the first place is more important than, than that and uh, we will be discussing that with Stephen Jones who Shaman mentioned the Royal College of Nursing interim head uh, at about 7.40. Shaman, thank you.
Uh, by the way, if uh, anyone uh, you know uh, is affected by issues like this, you can call Samaritans on 116123 or email joe at samaritans.org. Still to come here on Breakfast, uh, half past seven, I'll talk to ActionAid UK about how much help can reach Gazans during the four-day pause in fighting. As just mentioned, uh, I'll also be speaking to the interim head of the Royal College of Nursing about that uh, story we just discussed with Shaman. That'll be at about 7.40. After eight o'clock, I'll speak to the Labour Party chair, Annalise Dodds. Uh, and uh, up next, I will be talking to Mel Stride, the Work and Pension Secretary. Uh, time to quickly check in uh, some front pages this morning, uh, which are dominated by reaction to yesterday's migration figures. Suella leads a Tory revolt, splashes the Daily Mail, quoting the former Home Secretary as saying, the record tally is a slap in the face for voters. The Telegraph writes of cabinet pressure piling on the Prime Minister, as does the Times, which says ministers are urging Rishi Sunak to implement an urgent response. Make it stop, declares the mirror, listing the government's multiple challenges. And away from that, the Guardian claims in an exclusive that the king is profiting from the assets of dead citizens via an archaic custom. Well, here representing the government this morning, as I just mentioned, is Mel Stride, the Work and Pensions Secretary. A very good morning to you, uh, Mr morning, Stride. Thanks, thanks so much for joining us. Um, I, I want to start a uh, big picture question. There was a, a poll in, uh, in the Times this morning from YouGov that uh, saw your party uh, opinion uh, approval rating raise from 21% to 25%, a four-point decent jump, albeit still, still low uh, mm. readings overall. Do you, do you think this is all down to the autumn statement? I think the autumn statement was extremely important because I think it's a pivot point in our economic journey. We've come from a very difficult situation with the war in Ukraine, the inflationary pressures that that brought. Of course, that followed on from COVID, where we had to lay out hundreds of billions of pounds to support both the economy and people up and down the country through furlough and things like that. And that's had the consequence of putting pressure on taxes. But what we were able to do now, because we have got inflation down very substantially and we're, we've already hit our target of halving it by the end of this year, is to now come forward with some targeted tax cuts. And I think what the Chancellor did was exactly the right thing because he put those tax cuts into the supply side of the economy. So that's a huge tax break for businesses to encourage them to invest going forward. That's the 100% um, uh, deductions that they can have against uh, their investments. But also a tax cut for 27 million people who are working by reducing their national insurance. In fact, the biggest tax break uh, since the 19. Mm -hmm. 80s. So I think those are very important things. So they're not going to change things incredibly overnight, like that. but they are the decisions that will lead to the long-term improvements that will allow us to do all the things that we want to do as a government, including improving uh, the living standards uh, of people and supporting our public services. You mentioned the supply side of the economy. The most mm. critical factor, of course, is workers in, on the supply side yes. of the economy. Your, your brief, a uh, very key part of your brief. Let's talk about the overall number of people, first of all, the legal migration numbers, which we just mentioned, dominated the front pages of a lot of the, mm. the uh, newspapers uh, this morning. It's very high, certainly relative to history, and uh, even more so relative to the 2019 Tory manifesto pledges. So my question to you, first of all, is are these numbers too high? And if so, is that on your government for making the changes that, that allowed more people to come in. This is legal migration. So we accept that these figures are too high. They are, uh, they are definitely too high. Uh, we have brought forward a number of measures, actually, that according to the OBR are beginning or will see those figures come down. For example, the, what if I can, Will, just very... I think it's you important. said they're too high. Yes. Have we got to this point based on errors of your own government since 2019? Well, one of the reasons why we've had high levels of uh, immigration is actually to uh, support the labour market, which is why in that autumn statement there were some really important measures, including in my area, for making sure we increase labour supply. Now, one of those things, for example, is we have two and a half million long-term sick and disabled people uh, in our country. Uh, we know that one in five of those people want to work, but half of them 
are fearful of working because they think it might lead to them losing their benefits. So what we're doing actually is coming forward uh, with something called the chance to work guarantee, mm -hmm. which means we won't remove those benefits. We won't even reassess those people for those benefits uh, in the event that they go uh, and work. And I think that could be a real game changer, along with two and a half billion pounds that the Chancellor has brought forward in terms of health uh, support, talking therapies in the NHS, 400,000 more of those and so on, to encourage people to go in and work. And it is beginning to work. Economic inactivity is down 300,000 people since its peak in the pandemic, for example. I I'm interested, though, that last year, 745,000 people came in relative to your 2019 pledge of getting it down from 226,000. What portion of that is totally legitimate? You, you mentioned there was a demand for labour. Uh, maybe you'll offset that in future with domestic people coming back into the labour force. Yeah. What portion of that was legitimate needed workers versus people abusing the system? Uh, and do you embrace some of the measures Robert Jenrick has, has been... Well, well we, we, we recognise that there are different types of uh, immigration. Um, there is immigration, for example, 150,000 students bringing in dependents is an area where we have started to restrict that. And that will make a, a, a big difference, as indeed the OBR and others uh, recognise. But the, immig the immigration or migration that is not acceptable and is completely wrong is clearly the small boats coming across the short Dover Straits. And there we have uh, adopted a series of approaches, greater cooperation with the French, a deal with Albania that's seen those numbers drop by 90%, such that we're actually a third down year on year in terms of the numbers coming across. Now, that's at the same time, Wilf, that across Europe, those numbers are going in exactly the opposite direction. In fact, in, uh, on average across Europe, they're about a third up, we are a third down. But there's more to do, and that's why things like the Rwanda policy and other approaches are so important. Two more very quick topics, if, if we can. The, f the first is Amazon workers are striking today at a fulfillment centre in Coventry. Uh, in a dispute over pay. The national living wage this week was increased to £11.44 per hour. Mm. These workers, some of them, have been offered an increase to £11.80 per hour. This is Amazon, a company worth £1.5 to offer 36p more per hour than the living wage. Is, is that a bit tight of Amazon? Well, no, I, I'm not going to start um, sort of having a rounding commentary on different employees and what they're offering to... Uh, their staff, those, those are matters for them. Fourth there, biggest there is company a, in the world, well, 36 what, 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 what matters is, is what we're doing at a government level, and I'd make two points. One is we have really reduced the, the level of national insurance, which is a tax cut for 27 million people working, and we've also done a similar thing for the self-employed as well. And the second point is this national living wage point. So come April, the national living wage will, have, will be going up by around 10%, so well above where inflation will be at that point. And of course, that comes on top of the near 10% increase in the national living wage that happened last April. So we are taking millions of workers, lowest paid workers, pay up. But as for individual companies, that is a matter for them. But as a government, we are on the side of those that are the lowest paid. Presumably, you'd like to see it quite a lot higher than that, though, if, if they can afford it. Well, but these are matters for these individual companies, given mm -hmm. the markets they're in and the conditions and so on and so forth. But what I'm saying is the government is absolutely on the side of those that uh, are the lowest paid. The national insurance uh, uh, changes, the national living wage changes. We're the government that doubled the personal allowance. Now, on the tax front, that's the amount of money that you can earn without having to pay any tax at all. We doubled that amount since 2010. So we are really on the side of those that are earning the least. And then just uh, to, to round things off, Mr Stride, touching on the hopeful uh, continuation of this pause in fighting in, in the Middle East, which has yeah. begun over the last couple of hours. Are you optimistic uh, as a government that this might go on, not just through today, but, but for more than the initial four days? I think it's very difficult to speculate on that other than to say that I, th I really welcome the progress that all parties have made. And I know that uh, our Prime Minister, who's been out to the region and met many of the leaders uh, there, um, that uh, Lord Cameron and the work that we've done, particularly with the Qataris actually as an intermediary, has led to the point where we now have this ceasefire for this, this temporary period. And hopefully that is now going to lead very quickly to the release of at least some of the hostages. 
Very important also to be getting fuel in, uh, that's very important, uh, and humanitarian aid. And we've announced uh, just today that actually we'll be doubling the amount of humanitarian aid that we're going to be providing of, uh, as a country. That's another £30 uh, million. Pounds. So we are fully engaged in doing all that we can in what is a very, very difficult situation. Mel Stride, thank you so much. Thank you. Quick look at the weather now. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. An increasingly northerly wind will make it colder for most this weekend, bringing extensive overnight frosts. Uh, northern and eastern Britain are bright and uh, quite cold now, but a raw wind has limited the frost. Uh, the southwest is milder, but much cloudier. The morning will be quite sunny for most, with a stiff northerly wind bringing gales and a hail and snow uh, storm later on. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Coming up here on Sky News Breakfast, I'll talk to ActionAid UK about how much help can reach Gazans during the four-day pause in fighting. In sport, it's another world-class performance from Chelsea star Sam Kerr in the Champions League. And the wonky tree that locals in one Cambridgeshire town say is killing their Christmas cheer. Lots more to the camp. Welcome back to Sky News Breakfast. Uh, South Africa's former Paralympic star Oscar Pistorius is getting another chance at early release, almost a decade after being jailed for killing his girlfriend, Reva Steenkamp. I'm joined now by our Africa correspondent, Yusra El Bagir, who's outside the maximum security prison where Oscar Pistorius is being held. Yusra, very good morning to you. So, 
Uh, has this hearing process begun? When are we expecting uh, the, the uh, outcome of it? And, and what exactly are they discussing? Is this a sort of normal parole type hearing? Well, we've been here before, Will. We were here eight months ago when this very same hearing was happening where they were trying to discuss whether or not he could be released since he had served half his time. But we were told then that there was a miscalculation. He actually hadn't served half his time. But that was taken to the constitutional court and appealed. And now today they're going through the same process with the awareness that they've made that mistake and that he actually was deserving of a parole hearing and an opportunity to walk free eight months ago. So what's happening inside the prison right now is an assessment of his behavior, of how he's been. Uh, we heard eight months ago that he was a model prison, a prisoner and that he was uh, showing all the signs of good re behavior and rehabilitation. And we are, there's a very high expectation today that he will be uh, told that he can walk free and whether or not he'll walk free today will be up for debate. Now, the Steen camps, the, the family of Riva, his, uh, his girlfriend that he shot and killed uh, 10 years ago, are not opposing his early release this time around. They were strongly against it last time. But since then, Riva's father, Barry, passed away in September. And uh, June Steen camp, her mother said that she's been dealing with the grief uh, of losing her husband, but also uh, Reva's 40th birthday, which passed recently. So her representative today came and said that this was just too much to bear for her. And they will express later whether or not they were opposing the, 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 the judgment by the parole hearing and why they aren't opposing it. And, and so you, sir, we're expecting the outcome, what, in a matter of hours? I think within the next few hours, we'll definitely know uh, what the next steps are for, for Pistorius, whether he'll be able to, to walk free. And there is also an, a, an expectation that he could actually leave today. So we're kind of all on tenterhooks waiting to see what will happen, hopefully by noon. Yusra, thanks so much. Uh, Yusra Elbegir uh, there for us in Pretoria. Now, trucks have now entered Gaza from Egypt via the Rafah crossing this morning after the truce began. Qatar, which mediated the truce and hostage talk, said the deal would allow aid into Gaza as soon as possible. Egypt has said 130,000 litres of diesel and four trucks of gas will be delivered daily to Gaza during the pause, along with uh, 200 trucks of aid. I'm joined uh, now by Mike Noyes uh, from ActionAid UK. Mike, very good morning to you. Thanks well, thank you. Um, so much for joining me. I mean, this pause in a lot of the coverage over the last week is understandably focused on the, the exchange of, of, of hostages yeah. for, for prisoners. It's also, of course, about aid as well. Yeah. Um, t talk us through what scale of aid you're expecting to get in. I think the first thing to say is we welcome that this pause has come. We welcome the release of hostages, of course. Uh, we are worried that a four-day pause in itself isn't that long after 45 days of bombardment, after 45 days of displacement of, of so many people and after 45 days of very little aid getting into Gaza. That said, we've got four days. It's a start. Uh, we hope it will continue. Uh, it's really important to see that there's fuel coming through and gas because obviously without cooking gas, you know, having having food without cooking gas is is a major problem. So so that that's a great start for us. We've been managing to get a little bit of stuff done in the south of Gaza over the past few weeks in terms of hot food now and then in terms of getting clothes to people who've left because it's starting to get cold and wet there. Um, we're hoping we can scale up. We are worried about the state of the roads in Gaza. You, you, can, you can truck things in, you can get them into a warehouse. How we'll go to get them out and distribute them, I think, is the, and, and get things going, I think, is our biggest worry at the moment. The, the four days, if it all holds, and, and the number yeah. of trucks per day that we just mentioned, give us a, a, a gauge relative to what's got in in the last few weeks. What's that like? And relative to ideal circumstances, what you'd like to see get in. I mean, What's it's like? um, it's a scaling up. I mean, I think I think you know, it's it's sort of sort of five or six times what what has been getting in on on a good day. It's still less than what you would have expected to cross into Gaza, you know, prior to these things starting, prior to the conflict, uh, latest uh, uh, surge. So, it's a start. It's hopefully going to allow people to. To have access to food and stuff. As we say, the the distribution of it once it gets in is at least as important as, as what comes across. What it won't do, of course, is put the infrastructure back. We, you know, we might. You know, we're, we're hoping, for example, in one of the shelters we're working with, mm -hmm. that the water is out. 
if we can get fuel for the water pumps, that's a start. But due to the bombardment, some of the systems have been damaged. Whether we'll be able to get those back up and running is a challenge and needs more than four days. It's why we need a longer lasting ceasefire. And ActionAid has people on the ground ready to help with the distribution? Uh, some we, have us... a, we have a small team in Gaza of our, of our own staff, Palestinians of course, and we work with four or five local organisations, some of them are women's groups. Uh, we work with a hospital up in the north that is now out of action, was bombarded earlier in the week, lost staff. We don't know whether we can help them get back up and running in this gap, but yeah, we have quite a strong network across all of Gaza that we can work with. How much and do they need this aid to arrive? First of all, what they need is things to stop. What they need is an end to this. You know, a, a pause of four days mm -hmm. for it to restart is not what they need. Is not what they, they're, they're telling us what they need above all as an end. But if we can get that, if if we can start with this, if we can get things coming in, then it will start to make a difference. As we as we know, we've got uh, families that we're working with who are sleeping out out without mattresses, without blankets, without any form of shelter, and it's starting to rain. If, yeah, even just getting them warm clothes and, and, and blankets and, and, yeah, and raincoats will be a start for them. Mike Noyce, thanks Thank so much. You. Much appreciated. By the way, if you scan the QR code, it'll take you to the Sky News Daily Podcast. Neil Patterson sitting down with hostage negotiator James Alvarez to discuss what it takes to free captives, captives excuse me, safely. Uh, Middle East correspondent Ali Bunkle also uh, on the episode explaining what led up to the temporary truce between Israel and Hamas. Make sure to subscribe to the Daily Podcast. Now returning to the warnings from the Royal College of Nursing that their members are reporting a growing mental health crisis. Uh, we're joined now by Stephen Jones, uh, who's the RCN's union uh, interim head of nursing practice and uh, also the UK lead spokesperson for mental health. Um, we summed up some of these numbers uh, earlier, Stephen, when Shaman was uh, on set with me. But, but just uh, recap them for us, because I think I'm right in saying that the number of uh, nursing staff reporting suicidal thoughts has, has pretty much doubled. Yes, that's correct. Um, so what we found, so I did give, give a bit of context. So in May of this year, our members voted on a mandate to the OCN to lobby the government for the implementation of an integrated suicide prevention program for the nursing workforce across the UK. And this is off the back of we know already that there is an increased risk of suicide amongst female nurses compared to the general population. And part of our work was to look at our own data to see well, what are our members telling us? Uh, what support are people seeking and are there any trends we need to be aware of and quite surprising to be fair that we knew there would be some but to see the level of um, those reporting suicidal thoughts um, it has increased 98 um, percent over the first 10 months of this year compared to last year um, and another figure would be uh, October two years ago, um, we had approximately one caller a week who would be disclosing suicidal thoughts, whereas in 2023, it works out at almost one a day. Wow, what one a day. Um, and, and why do you think that is? So, as I said, we already know female nurses are at a 23% increased risk of suicide compared to the general population. Um, from research that's already been done, we know that persistent uh, understaffing and tolerable pressures at work and financial insecurity at home uh, may be contributing factors. Um, for us, we are taking a deep dive. So we're commissioned, we've commissioned a piece of research to really look at the specific context underpinning this issue. I think when we talk about such a sensitive topic, we need to be appreciative of the complexity. Um, so we do need to make sure that we get it right and we have a proper understanding of what's going on. Um, so we will be looking at specific demographics, what those contributing factors may be, um, and what type of support nurses are seeking. So whether they're seeking that counselling therapy type support, or whether they're seeking support for their finances, or even help for challenges at work. I was going to ask about that. I mean, I mean everyone talks about mental health a lot more now, which is great, but it's a, a small uh, step forward. Do, do you feel like there's a sentiment in the medical profession not to seek help themselves, perhaps, or almost a sense of duty that they shouldn't do? I, I don't know what the sentiment is, but but is that a factor here or, or not? Yes, it is. We, we know that there is, um, whatever we call it, that we could call it a, a stigma, or there's this issue around um, self-disclosing our own issues or our own struggles as nurses. Um, I think historically, and I know this narrative has changed slightly in the sense that healthcare staff 
are viewed as heroes and therefore they can push through and drive on. But we have just been through um, a pandemic. There's huge backlog in waiting lists and uh, we, our staff have been through a lot of trauma, but also facing the financial crisis moving forward. Um, so, yes, it's it's. Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question again? Sorry, I got off on a slide. No, I, d I was just saying whether there was, you, you used the word stigma, which I think was the, the right one, but uh, whether medical professionals don't sufficiently seek help themselves. Uh, obviously, we need to sort out the original cause, uh, much more importantly. Uh, but but once uh, experiencing mental health issues, uh, I wondered whether you thought that, that, that they perhaps were trying to be too strong. I, just an, a, yes, a, an yes, odd it, question. No, no, yeah, no, sorry, yes, exactly. So with regards to... To that point, we are a caring profession as nurses, doctors, healthcare professionals, and sometimes we do struggle to put ourselves into um, into the place where we need care ourselves. So quite often nurses do uh, let things get to a point where it becomes unbearable before we seek support. Um, so, but we could, there's a lot we can do before we reach then. There is that whole need for, for prevention. It needs a culture shift. We need to be able to support our colleagues. Um, in the workplace, we need to be mindful about how we we engage and and, and interact with other people, um, but also how we can support people informally. You know, for a lot of people, uh, the, the distress we are seeing in the workplace is a natural response to really challenging situations. Um, so we have to be careful not to always over pathologize or, or, or put labels to what that means, um, but actually allow people to realize we do all get we all get stressed, we all get distressed but we need to be able to notice that and know when we can support each other. So I think there's definitely that need for, for leadership and uh, leading by example. And there is a, a better push for reducing that stigma and helping understand that there are uh, there is help available. And I think for me, it's always down to the point that we have to be clear that we have to fundamentally implement hope. Uh, people must see hope through through these challenging times. Um, and people must have access to that informal support at work, whether it's via occupational health or wellbeing services. But as I say, also that culture needs to be embedded um, so that we have healthy working environments and to reduce that stigma. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. And sadly, we're out of time, but uh, really important story. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you or anyone you know uh, have been affected by these sorts of issues, you can call Samaritans, uh, 116 123, or email joe at samaritans.org. Org. Now, time for some sport. What have we got on the agenda, James? Oh, today there's a bit of Davis Cup, a bit of uh, Chelsea women in the Champions League last night, and uh, we're building up to the Premier League, which is back after the international break. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with Vitality. Welcome to the Roast Restaurant here in central London. We are lucky enough today to be joined by three elite athletes. Now they're going to be cooking a cultural dish all related to their heritage. It's going to be fun. Let's go see who they are. Right, we're very lucky. We found a gap in the training schedule of a great British Olympic athlete. Lavia Nilsson joined us in the kitchen, cooking for us today. What have you got for us, Lavia? So this is a traditional Sudanese dish. That's my mum's heritage. It's called mahshi in Arabic, but it's basically a stuffed vegetable dish. Uh, it's got rice, and we're doing a vegan version today with some brown lentils instead of minced meat. So yeah, really excited about it. My sister and I, we, we learned from our mum, you know, the value of a home-cooked meal. And you're... So growing up in your in your household, you said your mum was Sudanese and Egyptian, and your dad was from Denmark, right? So a, quite a multicultural household. Yeah, my mum, you know, she taught us she taught us to appreciate food from every culture, um, mainly Sudanese <laughs> food. Um, we never sat in front of the television. We always sat on a you know a dining table, always talking about school and sport and everything like that. So. And the good thing about my heritage is that the Sudanese diet is kind of influenced by both African and sort of Mediterranean diet. And we all know a Mediterranean diet is really good for you. So I always say like herbs can add a lot of flavour to your dish. So we're actually going to use lentils for this dish, which makes it completely vegan, which is great. We're also going to add our herbs at the same time. Get the flavour in there. Look at that, come on. 
And one last thing. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. The Premier League is back. Excellent uh, news. So you're watching Sky News Breakfast and still to come here, we'll speak to Dutch communities feeling threatened after hard-right populist Gert Wilders uh, sweeps to election victory uh, in the Netherlands. We'll be right back. push the protesters further back here. There's around two or three hundred still remaining. I'm Dan Whitehead and I'm Sky News's West of England correspondent. This van goes onto the streets of Plymouth seven days a week, 365 days a year. These facilities at the, mo at the moment are, are a lifesaver, it's all, it's all we've got. From fishing communities to bustling cities, we spend every day reporting from across the region, hearing from people who have real stories. I have nowhere to live for about three or four months. There are still people inside the properties here. They are coming from the epicentre of what is now a global health pandemic. seeing and speaking to young women who were selling themselves right on the high street. It was desperately sad and the fact it was happening right in the heart of this community. Before Brexit, these oysters were being exported to the EU, but the trade stopped overnight. What's your feeling about the future then? Blake might all be finished, I don't know. Welcome back. Uh, Dutch Muslims have expressed shock and dismay at the election win of far-right populist Gert Wilders, who's previously called for mosques and the Quran to be banned in the Netherlands. Mr Wilders' party, which won the most seats in Parliament, will now enter talks to form a governing coalition. Sky's Europe correspondent Adam Parsons has been speaking to people in Rostam. Greeted like a hero. Hert Wilders has spent decades waiting to win an election and now his moment has come. This was a meeting of a parliamentary party that has suddenly doubled in size. In reality, it was a celebration. Whether you call him a populist, a radical or a troublemaker, he now leads the biggest party in the Dutch parliament. What is the one thing you would like to do to change your country? One of the most important things we would like to do is, of course, to limit the influx of asylum and migration. That is one of the main themes that our campaign has tackled. That was certainly not the only theme. It's also been about welfare. People having more money in their pockets, receiving decent and affordable care, including the elderly. He will now try to form a coalition, and that won't be easy. Many parties refuse to work with Wilders, but make no mistake, this was a seismic victory. 
and Wilders wants to be Prime Minister. Elsewhere, shock and anxiety. For decades, Wilders has made life uncomfortable for Dutch Muslims. He's compared the Koran to Mein Kampf and says he wants to ban mosques. That's left some feeling isolated, nervous about being ostracised. But others think Wilders is more about bluster than genuine threat. If I have a Dutch, we call it a Dutch um, identity. identity card, like this, you know, let me say this is my passport. I have a passport. You can you can send me back to Turkey or Morocco or Algeria. It's not possible. A lot of the people we've spoken to here have told us that they didn't vote, that they think politicians ignore them or forget about them, that they won't do anything anyway. But the ones who did vote tended to go for Wilders. He tapped into the idea that social problems can be traced back to immigration. And this time, it resonated. He's my brother. He lives here in the Netherlands. He doesn't have a, a, a house. But if somebody from other place come to here, they get a house immediately. You know what I'm saying? And that's, that's what I think is the problem. This is the latest in a line of victories for Europe's populist politicians. Wilders has spent decades as an outsider. Now he's come in from the cold. Adam Parsons, Sky News, Rotterdam. Just uh, a little bit of time left for the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to sponsored by Qatar Airways. An increasingly northerly wind will make it colder for most this weekend, bringing extensive overnight frosts. Northern and eastern Britain are bright and quite cold now, but a raw wind has limited the frosts. The southwest is milder, uh, but much cloudier. That's your weather. To fly, to the weather. Sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, coming up in the next hour here on Sky News Breakfast, a live update from our Middle East correspondent Ali Bunkle as the temporary truce between Israel and Hamas takes effect. We'll be right back.
A very good morning to you. It is 8 o'clock. This is Sky News Breakfast. A four-day humanitarian truce has come into effect between Israel and Hamas with 50 Israeli hostages and 150 Palestinian prisoners expected to be released over the next few days. But what comes next? We'll hear from the Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem and the Director of the Palestinian Solidarity Campaign. Plus, how would Labour address record-breaking migration figures if they were in government? We'll speak to Labour Party's Chair Anna Lee's Dodds. All of that coming up in the next hour. It is Friday, the 24th of November. Well, so far, the truce appears to be holding with no major reports of bombings, artillery strikes or rocket attacks. And trucks have been seen moving at the Rafah crossing from Egypt into Gaza, where aid and fuel deliveries have been promised. The priorities will be getting hostages out of Gaza and as much aid as possible into the Strip. But Israel has warned that once this truce is over, the fighting will resume. As pressure mounts on the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak over rising migration, a government minister tells me the record numbers must come down. We accept that these figures are too high. Buses and police cars are torched in Dublin after a stabbing outside a school left three children and a woman injured. A decade after killing his girlfriend on Valentine's Day, former South African track champion Oscar Pistorius is seeking another chance at early release from the prison behind me. Nissan is set to announce its commitment to making new electric car models in Sunderland, preserving thousands of jobs in the process. And in sports, Sam Kerr scores a brilliant hat-trick as Chelsea win in the Champions League group stages. And Great Britain have been knocked out of the Davis Cup tennis. They've been beaten in the quarterfinals by Novak Djokovic's Serbia. A very good morning to you. A temporary truce has come into effect in the Israel-Hamas war. It sets the stage for the exchange of hostages held in Gaza and Palestinians imprisoned in Israel. Uh, if it holds for the four days, as planned, it will be the first significant break in fighting since Israel declared war on Hamas seven weeks ago in response to the terrorist group's attacks on October the 7th. Well, joining me now from Tel Aviv is our Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bunkle. And, uh, Ali, first of all, I mean, we are hours into it, but uh, are the early signs that the truce is holding? Yeah, the early signs are good. The Israelis carried out quite large bombardments uh, in the minutes leading up to 7 o'clock, our time here, when the truce came into effect. Actually, at 7.15, there were air raid sirens uh, along the Gaza border and a couple of rockets from Gaza were intercepted. But apart from that, uh, the truce does appear to be holding. And you would expect that in the hours leading up to a ceasefire, as we see uh, in wars around the world, and we've seen here before, that both sides use those last few minutes to try and press home uh, their respective military advantages. What was interesting this time, though, is that unlike in other conflicts between Israel and Hamas, there was no massive rocket barrage out of Gaza into Israel. And that might suggest that Hamas's military capabilities and its abilities to fire rockets, which they have been doing daily, but their abilities to fire them en masse and at long range have been degraded quite significantly by the Israelis. Ali, cl clearly uh, this has been covered mainly as uh, hostages exchanged um, for prisoners and, and a cease to the fighting. It's also very much about allowing aid in, and it seems like the first few trucks have been uh, making their entry into Gaza. Yeah, absolutely. There's multiple uh, facets to this ceasefire, and aid is a really big part of it. So we are expecting around 200 trucks a day to be allowed into Gaza uh, with vital supplies on, but also fuel. Uh, they've had very little fuel being allowed to enter into Gaza over recent weeks, and, and they need it. Uh, Israelis are worried that Hamas will use the fuel for their own advantage, but it, but it is needed for powering desalination plants, for sewage works, and just actually lighting things like hospitals and, and allowing the equipment to run there properly. So that, that's going to be very important indeed. 200 trucks sounds a lot. On an average day in peacetime, uh, 500 trucks go into Gaza with aid. So it's still not enough, but 
that humanitarian surge, I think, will come over the coming days. And the likes of Jordan and the UAE have said they'll set up field hospitals in southern Gaza as well. Uh, Ali Bunker, thanks so much, uh, as always. Uh, Alistair and the team, uh, full coverage throughout the day here on uh, Sky News at this uh, potentially groundbreaking moment in the conflict. Also this morning, the arduous process of forming a new governing coalition is beginning today in the Netherlands after far-right populist Gert Wilders' shock victory. With almost all votes counted, Mr Wilders' party for freedom is forecast to win 37 parliamentary seats, the highest tally, albeit of a total of 150. His election pledges included calling a referendum on the Netherlands' EU membership and a halt on accepting any asylum seekers. China says no unusual or novel pathogens have been found among outbreaks of respiratory illness in the country's north. The government says data shared with the World Health Organization suggests the spike is linked to the lifting of COVID restrictions, as well as a common bacterial infection that mainly affects children. Amazon workers are staging a Black Friday strike at the online retailer's site in Coventry during one of the busiest shopping days of the year. Similar action is taking place elsewhere in Europe and in the US in long-running disputes over pay. Amazon says customers won't be affected and insists its pay and conditions are fair. A crane worker involved in the dramatic rescue of a man from a burning building in Reading has described the ordeal as a close call. Glenn Edwards manoeuvred a cage in place, allowing the man to escape smoke and flames billowing around him. The second man was also rescued. Both were treated in hospital for smoke inhalation. We are going to pivot uh, now uh, and listen in to the press conference in Dublin following uh, the stabbings and the unrest overnight that we uh, have mentioned Order already in the show. Board in about, uh, between half eight and nine o'clock as we deployed more resources. Thank you. Any questions, Paul? Commissioner, uh, did you fail the people of Ireland? Did you fail the country? There's three hours uh, last night that you have said. Some people would say longer that we can't have been restored to 11 o'clock last night. Did you fail the people of Ireland by failing to protect the citizens and the city? No, the Angarda Chicana respond to this entirely and in, a, in um, an extraordinary fashion. Uh, members from across the country, not just here in DMR, responded, returned to duty. Public order units from all over Ireland responded here to Dublin. More and more resources were, were arriving throughout the evening. But we could not have anticipated that in response to a terrible crime, the stabbing of school children and their teacher, that this would be the response. In, a th in effect, uh, those filled with hate and the hate directed towards members of Garda Shikana, that they would attempt to storm through our cordon and disrupt the crime scene and then engage in violence, looting and disorder, and including some very significant criminal damage. Nobody could have anticipated that uh, uh, when these events broke, uh, when these events uh, started at 1.30, these awful events, and obviously we were concentrated upon the investigation. We couldn't have anticipated that this would be the reaction. But people will say, why weren't you monitoring social media, the far-right groups, who you say uh, 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 exacerbated the situation? Why didn't you move quicker when you saw the build-up of tensions, both online and on the streets? Well, the build-up of tensions, as, as you describe on social media, we were monitoring those, and we were constantly then adding to our resources that were available uh, in DMR North Central. That was an ongoing part of the operation and we did respond, but uh, it has to be said that the crowds, the crowds of those in the first place protesting, filled with hate, directed towards members of Garda Shikana, were then supplemented with those who were only intent upon crime, disorder and the looting of premises. And one can see this morning, particularly uh, sports type shops were specifically targeted. Now, Gardaí reacted quickly uh, to that and uh, were able to clamp down on that looting, but um, we responded as the events unfolded. But I don't think at 1.30, as the, as the original events unfolded, or indeed later in the mid-afternoon, we could have anticipated such disorder. Richard. <laughs> Training. It's a failure of resources, it's a failure of personnel, but these are problems they have spoken about for a long time. And they also say that's clear and what happened last night, and we saw shocking scenes where individual Gardaí were isolated and pursued and attacked. Well, this is not a failure of personnel. All, all members of Angarda Shikanda 
responded to this. Everyone stood up to the plate in terms of their response. I now have to look to the tactics that we have for public order. We have not seen public order situations like this before. This may be um, behaviour which is apparent in other countries, but I think that we've seen an element of radicalisation. We have seen a group of people who take literally a thimble full of facts and make a, ba- a bathtub of assumptions, hateful assumptions, and then conduct themselves in a way which is riotous and, disrupt- and, and disruptive to our society. We then have to respond to that in terms of our tactics and training. But there's no failure here. There's no failure. This is uh, regrettably how protests have moved on, and now we have to graduate and have a proportionate response to that. We saw something similar a few weeks ago at the Doyle. Uh, two uh, months ago, well, we saw public representatives harassed and threatened outside our national parliament. Well, with respect, what happened last night was an entirely different response or uh, uh, scale to the events outside the Doll, and the Doll has now received a new uh, police and response to the public order situations. Now, we have adapted our tactics there, but we're going to have to have a fundamental review of our public order tactics, given the amount of violence directed towards uh, citizens, members of Garda Shikana, but also the community. Richard, yeah. sorry, can we go to Richard here? Sorry. failed last night. Is this an admission to the public that the tactics fail last night? On O'Connell Street, there was for a good period of an hour where people were running lawlessly, people were fleeing in panic on O'Connell Street as buses went up in flames. I mean, is this an admission that you've got things wrong? Well, I'm not going to say we've got things wrong. What we saw last night was an, ex- an extraordinary outbreak of violence, and we have to then respond accordingly in terms of our... our uh, graduated response to the policing of disorder but the, these are scenes that we have not we have not seen in decades but what is clear that people have been radicalized through uh, social media over the internet and so you have a terrible event and I don't want to lose focus on it on the terrible event in terms of the uh, assault dreadful assault on the school children and their teacher like that's a full investigation that's ongoing there's also a full investigation now in respect of the disorder and, and we have literally thousands of hours now of CCTV to trawl through. But many of these individuals, they are well known to us. They have criminal records. They've been in baller with us before. And we will go now through the long process of investigation and bringing them before the courts. You previously said this would be a graduated response, that things would be, I mean, it was characterised in the media as being a softly, softly approach to far-right demonstrations after what happened in Sandwich Street, an ancient protests at uh, centres being used for asylum seekers across the country. Surely now it's time for a tougher approach, because things as they progressed last night, there was a non-confrontational approach adopted by Gardaí. But clearly that just didn't work, and it, oh, well, the control it, of the capital was lost for a number of hours. Well, last night was not a non- uh, non-confrontational response uh, right from the br- outbreak of uh, the abuse of Gardaí followed them by disorder there was very clear direction given in terms of uh, what our response would be but and our response was in the first place more resources in the position then that we could make arrests 34 arrests have been made many more arrests will now follow individuals will be brought before the courts Are you concerned that there will be follow-up actions as a result of this if you know these, these groups are organizing online they might uh, try and follow up this even for days ahead well that has to be a, a, a plan and assumption they like would just we have to make that assumption that following the events of last night that we're going to see uh, further such protest uh, in which case then we'll have to put in place the police in response and look then to the equipment and tactics that we can have immediately available to us to respond. Okay, Peter. But, uh, uh, Commissioner, how much more of a threat now do you feel that those, as you say, are driven by right-wing ideology pose to law and order? What will you be doing? What will the Gardaí be doing to change and adapt to that from what we have seen last night? And just secondly, could you provide any update just on the, the actual assault in terms of the condition of the five-year-old girl mm-hmm. and have, has an arrest been made? Is an arrest going to be made uh, uh, and so on. Well, uh, in, in respect of the assault, investigations are ongoing. Uh, very significant inquiries were being conducted last night, but I have to say it's disgraceful that our inquiries, obviously, in the city centre were prevented and disrupted by the, by the disorder. Um, I understand <clears throat> that the five year old girl uh, is still in a very serious condition. Um, the uh, teacher, uh, her teacher, is also in a serious condition. Uh, no arrest has yet been made. 
but uh, a suspect has been identified. I'm sorry, just on the first part of that question, how much of a threat now does the far right in Ireland pose? Has that changed from what you saw last night? As you said yourself, historic levels of violence, looting, disorder, all sparked. I know you're going to say many of those uh, were opportunistic uh, participants and had nothing to do with the original issue, but it was clearly sparked by those, as you say, driven by far right ideology. How much has that now changed in Ireland? I would say um, I have to I have to take note on, on Garda Shikana in terms of our intelligence gathering investigation. Now I have to uh, well will will take notice of the change in attitude at the Cordon Point, the amount of abuse directed towards in Garda Shikana by significant numbers of those who were there, uh, in effect to breach our cordon, the breach the cordon of the crime scene. So that is a significant change. We'll have to adapt in terms of our policing response. And that means then that our tactics in respect of public order, the equipment we have available uh, for members of Angarda Shikana will have to adapt accordingly as well. Okay, one over in the left and then one last one over here, please. Are you concerned about it potentially spilling over again today? One after being put in place to keep the city safe today. And do you have any update on the Ellen Gardy that has injured any numbers of the last night? Uh, well, uh, uh, regrettably, one member of Angarda Shikana quite a serious uh, injury, and uh, we have to find out today. Um, uh, how that member is and, and uh, what the developments are in respect of that. Uh, we had numerous other members injured and we're collating the detail. A lot of members injured by uh, um, just in the riot in terms of uh, uh, things being thrown at them, projectiles being thrown at them, but also then uh, sprains, etc. And also it was an exhausting night in terms of just fast moving situation and in effect those in, engaged in, in riot uh, moving through the city centre. Uh, of course, I have concerns for today. We have a planning meeting at nine o'clock. We prepare for today and then the rest of the weekend. We need to, we need to put in place a significant mobilisation of the organisation, but I also have to see immediately then what other tactics are available to me to deal with public order. Okay, last question down here, sorry, last question down here, sorry. Sorry, just in regards to your advice to the public today, obviously a very busy shopping day. Should they avoid parts of Dublin City Centre today, especially as, as it moves into the evening? Um, just secondly, uh, last night you were, you were sort of not in a position to rule out a terror motive. Is that still your position in regards to the initial attack? Um, in, in regard to the initial attack, I'm, I'm not going to comment in respect of the motive because that is still not clear. The investigation is obviously focused upon uh, what the motive for this incident was in the first place. That is not yet clear and uh, so I'll not engage in speculation in respect of that. In respect of the city centre, people will see a very heavy guard of presence throughout the city today. I would encourage them to come to their work and uh, come and use the city. We can't allow the city to be given over to the thugs, and to the looters and to the arsonists. OK, thank you very much, thank everybody. You. Look, you're listening uh, there to Drew Harris, the Garda Commissioner. Of course, it follows a, a night of significant unrest in Dublin where 34 people uh, were arrested. And the unrest had originally broken out uh, following a knife attack earlier in the day that left uh, four people uh, injured. And uh, we're hearing there from uh, Commissioner Drew Harris, uh, who uh, did say that um, he'd not seen public disorder like this before. Another time he said it was the worst for decades. He said that all members of uh, his forces responded and stood up to what was asked of them. He said there was no failure uh, there and framed things more as seeing how protests have developed with new tactics um, used and uh, uh, had to, uh, asked questions um, about whether there was radicalization as part of this. And he did say we may have seen an element of radicalization. Well, Stephen Murphy uh, is there for us, and you might have heard him asking a couple of those questions. And Stephen, uh, quickly, your, your take on what we learned there. Oh, such a... An absolute historic Nasty. level Nasty. of rioting, disorder and violence was what we witnessed in Dublin last night. Uh, the Guardi giving us an update. 34 people arrest, 32 of those will appear before the courts this morning. We heard that, we thought last night one or two Garda vehicles, police cars have been set on fire. 11 
Garda vehicles were destroyed through arson and three Dublin buses, three of those double-decker uh, Dublin buses were destroyed by arsonists as well. It was characterised as huge destruction and certainly that ties in with a lot of what we saw on the ground, particularly on O'Connell Street last night. A lot of the thrust of questioning here from uh, myself and my colleagues towards the Commissioner was was this a failure in policing because Gardaí here have been warning of a rise in far-right uh, ideology for a, a time now. We have seen some other incidents in recent months, but the Garda Commissioner said he, his members responded in an extraordinary fashion and simply couldn't have anticipated such a response to what was initially, and shouldn't be forgotten, a terrible crime, the stabbing of several young children in broad daylight. And on that we got uh, an update as well. And sadly, the five-year-old girl who was seriously injured remains in a serious in, uh, injured state in hospital this morning, as does the woman in her 30s, who we know um, was her teacher at that primary school. And as you heard, I think the commissioner say there, no arrest has yet been made. And that's because the person who is the person of interest, the man at the centre of this, is himself still receiving medical treatment, we believe, under armed guard at an undisclosed uh, Dublin Hospital. So the Gardaí here, they have thousands of hours of CCTV to go through from last night's destruction. We heard that there were numerous injuries to the Irish police, the Gardaí members, and unfortunately one uh, officer is in a serious condition as well today. That was the update that we got from uh, the Garda Commissioner. And he said that there will be a heavy mobilisation of resources today. And we have seen a heavy police presence on the streets of Dublin. So there is calm at the moment, but it is certainly a, a slightly nervy calm, I would say, here in Dublin City today. Stephen Mercy in Dublin there for us. Thank you very much. Now, the Work and Pension Secretary has told me this morning that figures showing a record peak in net migration are unacceptable. The revised figure was 745,000 in the year to December 2022. Former Home Secretary Suella Bradman has described it as a slap in the face for voters. Well, joining me now is Annalise Dodds. Labour Party Chair and Shadow Secretary of State for Women and Equalities. Thank you so much for joining me. Very good morning to you. Good morning. Um, I wanted to get your take on, on these numbers that uh, have grabbed a lot of the attention on the, on the front pages this morning. What's Labour's target for uh, legal migration? Well, actually, we saw when David Cameron tried to introduce a target, that didn't work. But we are seeing, unfortunately, under the Conservatives, a complete lack of grip on this. What lies behind these figures and that really substantial increase is an appalling failure of the Conservatives. You know, overall, the volume of work visas is up by 54%. The volume of health and social care visas is up by 156%. The Conservatives have not taken the action that Labour's called for, for domestic skills, training, workforce planning. In fact, they've decided not to remove the 20% discount for those staff who come in from overseas on the shortage occupation scheme. They've not linked that to training either. So I'm afraid this really shows that very substantial failure of the Conservatives. I mean, it's hard to argue as well with, with the numbers. Uh, the 2019 manifesto, uh, they said they wanted to get it down and we were talking about uh, numbers uh, then in the 200,000s. It's now almost trebled to, to 700,000. Where, what scale will you rectify it to? Are you talking about getting it down a little bit, getting it back down to, to a third of the current level? Well, Labour believes that net migration should be going down because we shouldn't be seeing those huge increases in work visas. As I said, those huge increases in health and social care visas, that represents a massive failure in workforce planning, training and skills. And as I said, Labour has been calling for action here. The Conservatives have ignored those calls. We still have that Labour? situation. I'll we'll answer that question a moment ago. I'll answer it again. David Cameron tried to introduce a net migration target. It didn't work. What Labour's clear about is we need to have a fair and firm system, one that's controlled and one above all that actually serves our economy. If we've got a situation where we're seeing the volume of work visas going up and up year on year, and that's what we're seeing recently, as I said, up so substantially, that shows that the UK government is not actually supporting the domestic workforce. You know, people of all backgrounds who are not being given that support. You know, we've got huge numbers of people on NHS waiting lists, for example, at the moment, not moving into work. That's, I'm afraid, due to the Conservative government's inaction. But, but I think if you're saying, if it's 
on merit, then it's OK. So potentially on merit, the numbers could keep going up. No, we want to see net migration going down because we want to see that situation where work visas are going up under the Conservatives reversed because they're going up because the Conservatives are not providing that skills training. They're not also cancelling that 20% discount that's available for employers who are not focusing on training the domestic workforce themselves. And I'm afraid that's because the Conservative government has enabled them to neglect this. Now, that's got to change. Um, I wanted to move on to the truce that we're seeing, the pause in fighting that's been going on for a couple of hours now between uh, Hamas uh, and, uh, and Israel. Are you optimistic that that might last for days from here, perhaps even more than that? Well, I think everyone watching this will really be wanting to see that truce enable a period where hostages, of course, can be released. They must be released where we can see that much needed aid going into Gaza. There's a humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza at the moment, but also this being a space where those steps towards a cessation of violence for the future can be made. That's incredibly important. And, you know, as Keir Starmer has said many times, you know, countries including our own far too often, you know, we've talked about the two-state solution, but we've only talked about it really as a slogan. We've not been putting in that concerted effort to ensure that there is a proper diplomatic solution. We really need that space to be used right now because we must see ultimately a cessation of that violence. There's been a huge domestic argument, particularly within your party, but across the country, about the government should be pushing Israel towards a full ceasefire, humanitarian pause. Uh, I, I wonder, as we sit here now, and there is a truce at the moment that seems to be holding that hopefully we'll see aid in, hostages out, uh, some um, prisoners freed. Do, do you think it shows that Keir Starmer was right to focus on the gist of what is being arriving rather than worry too much about individual words? Well, I, th I think Keir Starmer was right to show leadership on this issue and above all, to be working with international partners. And that's what we really need to see now. We need to see that concerted diplomatic effort to ensure that there can be a long-term cessation of violence. We've got that space with a humanitarian pause. Labour's been calling for a long time for a humanitarian pause, a substantial one, with international partners so that we can, as you said, get the, hopefully, see the hostages being released, also see that much, much needed aid going in to deal with that humanitarian catastrophe, but also so that there can be those concrete steps being taken. That is so critically important. And, you know, I have to say to you, I've spoken to people of all backgrounds about the current situation. I haven't met anyone who hasn't been appalled by the horrific scenes that we've seen. And that applies whether we're talking about those dreadful Hamas terrorist attacks or whether we're talking about the, what's been happening in Gaza with you know, parents having to pull mm -hmm. dead children out of the rubble. This has been a horrendous time. And I think the overwhelming opinion of the whole British people is we need to do all we can to ultimately make sure there's peace in the future. Annalise Stoltz, thanks so much for joining us. Much appreciated. Uh, time to have a look in on what the front pages are saying uh, today. And uh, as mentioned, uh, it's been dominated by those uh, new migration figures that we got yesterday. Suella leads a Tory revolt, splashes the Daily Mail, quoting the former Home Secretary, as uh, saying the record tally is a slap in the face for voters. The Telegraph writes of uh, Cabinet pressure piling on the Prime Minister. As does the Times, which says ministers are urging Rishi Sunak to implement an urgent response. The Daily Mirror goes with Make It Stop, listing the government's multiple challenges. And The Guardian uh, goes with a different topic, claims uh, in an exclusive that the king is profiting from the assets of dead citizens via an archaic customer. Well, with me uh, in studio now to discuss all of the day's news, but political news in particular, our political correspondent, uh, Rob Powell. Rob, um, great to see you. So let's touch on these migration figures, first of all, and, and how, it's, how it's playing out. I mean, Mel Stride making quite clear that they know this is a big problem for themselves. Yeah, Mel Stride trying to link it with what we heard in his patch anyway in the autumn statement about trying to get more people into work domestically to reduce the need for people to come in to take those jobs. Actually quite similar to what Labour was getting at there 
Labour saying that part of the reason for this is a failure of planning domestically, uh, and that's why they're having to resort to essentially push the button and bring people in from overseas. Uh, what's, I think, interesting this morning, though, is what we are seeing in some of the papers, some of the ideas being pushed by the immigration minister, Robert Jemrick, they are a lot more short-term and a bit more short and sharp than just trying to improve the domestic picture. He's talking about things like um, scrapping the ability for people who come over here to work in social care from bringing dependents over with them, raising the salary that you need to get a visa as well. Now, some of these ideas have been floating around before, actually. They've been floating around when Suella Braverman was Home Secretary, but they ran into a degree of resistance among other cabinet ministers, because if you're going to start changing the rules around social care and health workers, well, what do you do to fill all the vacancies in the NHS at the moment? So I think there's a bit of a push and pull going on behind the scenes in government on this. But I'm told these are the sorts of ideas that are being looked at centrally by Number 10, that we should expect something at some point, probably not for the next week or so, but they need to try and figure out how to cut those numbers whilst not making some of the problems with job shortages worse. Which is a bigger issue for voters, this or small votes? Uh, I think the polling shows that small votes, small, small boats cuts through more than legal migration. But at the same time, if an image gets out, if a sort of narrative gets out that the government is allowing migration numbers, legal or otherwise, to spiral mm -hmm. and doesn't really care about it and isn't doing much about it, then that is damaging as well. Rob, as ever, thanks so much. Quick look at the weather now. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Mm, an increasingly northerly wind will make it colder for most this weekend, uh, bringing extensive overnight frosts. Uh, northern and eastern Britain are bright and quite cold now, but a raw wind has limited the frost. The southwest is milder, but much cloudier. That's your weather. To fly, the weather. Sponsored by Qatar Airways. You can see now that uh, with me here on set is Sir Trevor, Sir Trevor Phillips uh, with a preview of what's to come this Sunday. And this, I'm genuinely excited, Sir Trevor, because I don't even know what's coming. So, so tease and draw me in to Sunday. <laughs> 48 hours till our show, yeah. and you imagine I know what's going on. I mean, politics is moving so fast these days. You know, th this week, look, so it's 48 hours ago, we had a big budget and it was a big thing and with uh, tax cuts and arguments about whether Jeremy Hunt is really giving us back our money or not and that was a big story. This morning, hardly anybody's talking about it because what are we talking about? We're talking about immigration, immigration numbers uh, and of course also the goodish news from Gaza. So the speed at which politics is moving these days uh, what we're talking about this morning probably isn't going to be what we'll be talking about on Sunday morning. Uh, and in terms of uh, who we've got coming on to, to break down this moving feast, uh, who are we looking at? Well, I think that the, the thing that probably will survive is the thing you, uh, you've just been talking to Rob about, which is migration, because it's clear that this is a, a major issue for the country and the numbers you know, three quarters of a million last year, over 600,000 at first sight this year, and those numbers will probably go up. Um, for the Tories, this is quite familiar ground. They've had a little bump from the Hunt um, uh, budget this week in the polls, and I suspect that they are going to be pushing this immigration question because they also know Traditionally, it's, area, it's an area where uh, Labour's weak. We, we are going to be talking about all of that. We're also, by the way, going to be talking uh, history. Um, Andrew Roberts, the uh, renowned Cambridge historian, will be joining us. And I may even talk to him about Napoleon. Oh, well, I look forward to that because I read his... Uh, op I, I still don't tell Andrew this because he'll get upset, but I still can't wait to see the movie, even though he says historically it's terribly inaccurate. Yeah, well, you it's know... It's still going to be a great blockbuster. Well, as Ridley Scott... I, I expect I'm going to ask him, as Ridley Scott said to some historians, you think I'm wrong. Were you actually there at the Battle of Waterloo? Yeah, yeah. It's exactly. good fun. It's, it's going to be a good back and forth. And Andrew's also been out with a, a new book recently as well on the art of art of war. So uh, Indeed. Lots, lots to discuss with him, as, as always. So, Trevor, we look forward to 8.30am Sunday mornings. It should be appointment viewing for you if it is not already.
Now, uh, back to uh, the news. Nissan has announced it will commit to producing two new electric models of its best-selling cars at its plant in Sunderland, along with building a new battery factory. The company will invest £1.2 billion and will get a contribution from the government. The Sky News business correspondent Paul Kelso is at the plant for us this morning. Further investment from Nissan and the real story here this morning. I'm on the production line at the Sunderland plant. It's Britain's biggest ever car factory. These are Nissan Qashqai's, they're left-hand drive. They're heading for the continent. A reminder, this plant makes cars that go all over Europe. The big story here is not just that there will be a commitment to make uh, the electric successors to this vehicle and the Nissan Juke, but there's a commitment this morning to build a third battery gigafactory that will provide the powertrains for these new vehicles. 18 months ago, Boris Johnson was here uh, to announce government support for Nissan's initial uh, gigafactory, big investment on this site. It's being built at the moment. There's already a smaller battery factory making batteries for the Nissan Leaf. They committed 18 months ago to one factory. Today, a second gigafactory, three in total. Uh, they haven't said where it will be built uh, or indeed who will build it, but the partner for the existing battery factories is Envision, a Chinese-owned company. Uh, the total investment, £1.2 billion, they say, extra now, rising to £2 billion in total in due course. The usual rule of thumb about government support is around 10%, so we can, uh, we can speculate that between £100 and £200 million of the funding that Jeremy Hunt announced in his autumn statement to help uh, the automotive industry with the energy transition to low-carbon sources will be heading here, uh, we uh, got some words from the Prime Minister this morning. He says it's a massive vote of confidence in the UK automotive industry. And he says Sunderland is now the Silicon Valley of EV production. Of course, this is the Prime Minister who a couple of months ago delayed the phasing out of petrol and diesel engines by five years to 2035. The automotive industry, largely including Nissan, ignored him. They're sticking to 2030 as their deadline. And those electric vehicles and the batteries will be made here and in the UK. Paul Kelso there for us uh, at the Nissan plant in Sunderland. Now, former Olympian Oscar Pistorius is up for early release, 10 years after being jailed for killing his girlfriend, Reva Steenkamp. Let's uh, bring in our Africa correspondent, Yusra Elbegir, who's outside the maximum security prison where Pistorius is being held. And Yusra, just update us on exactly what this hearing is, is, is about. And I, I guess we could be getting a decision any minute now. This hearing is about his early release, and we do expect to hear from the parole board of their final decision within the next couple of hours. So everyone's kind of on standby waiting for that. But we have been in this position before eight months ago. There was a parole hearing for his early release, and then there was miscalculations around whether he'd served half his time, and so it was put off until now. So actually, the fact that there has been this error uh, does help him push against any uh, decision that might have him stay longer than he should uh, in the prison. But we've also heard uh, a victim statement, uh, victim impact statement by representative of the Steenkamp family uh, speaking on behalf of June, Reva's mother, his girlfriend, um, who he killed. And she is not staunchly opposing the parole hearing decision for his early release, but she is saying that she hopes that any rehabilitation that he's undergone in the prison addresses his anger issues and that she still believes that he has no remorse. Yusra El there for us in Pretoria. More from Yusra throughout the morning as and when the decision is made. Thank you. Now returning to our top story, a temporary ceasefire has come into effect between Israel and Hamas. Uh, I'm joined now by the Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem, Fleur Hassan Nahum. Um, a very good morning to you, Deputy Mayor. Thanks for, for joining us. You must welcome this pause. Well, let me tell you how the pause started. Um, at 10 o'clock was supposed to be, 7 o'clock was supposed to be the pause. And for 15 minutes, there was a barrage of rockets at the beginning of the ceasefire. So this is Hamas for you. Do, do you therefore feel that the pause has never really begun? Are you fearful that it is going to be a matter of hours, not a matter of days? Well, we, we've done what we've said we want, we're going to do as part of the deal to start getting our hostages home. Um, they've started by breaking the ceasefire, but nevertheless, 
It's at the moment quiet, and we're praying uh, that the 13 uh, babies and children and some of the mothers that are supposed to be released today, that's supposed to happen at four o'clock. But again, there's no trust in this barbaric terrorist organization who starts the ceasefire by breaking it and who, you know, we know have done horrific barbaric things to little babies, women, elderly. And, and so this is what we have. Do you feel uh, like you still have to give this a go? And are you happy that your government, your country has done so? Well, there's no happiness here for anything. But uh, we had a Sophie's choice, essentially. We could get the children and the women that we could get out right now, or we could wait and try and get more hostages out in the future. And the government decided that we wanted to save as many people as we could right now. Uh, it's very difficult in the country because there's another 200 and uh, odd hostages who are not getting out today, including other children. A little girl called Abigail, who's four years old. She's not getting out today. She's not getting out in the next few days. We don't understand why she's on the list. We also don't understand why the Red Cross are not giving access to get proof of life from the rest of the hostages. And that was one of the sticking points. Yesterday was supposed to be the beginning of the ceasefire, and it was pushed off for today because Hamas refused to give access to the Red Cross. And we still don't know whether they've been allowed access. Uh, obviously, the structure, you know, it's early, early days, hours in, and we need to be days in for this to apply. But the structure does allow uh, the deal to be extended if there's a steady flow of hostages released. I, I just wonder whether uh, that comes for you with a fear that it would also give time for Hamas to, to regroup or uh, overwhelmingly, as long as hostages are freed, is that all that mattered? Well, that's a great question. And that's exactly what the country is grappling with. Uh, do we give them an extra day where they're preparing to attack us? Because that's exactly what they're doing. They've said it themselves. Their leaders who are sitting pretty in, in Qatar in their luxury hotels are saying, we're going to do October the 7th again and again and again. So we know that they're preparing and we took that into account. But in Israel, value of life is very, very high. And we have a moral responsibility to those innocent civilians that were snatched from their beds, whose parents were killed in front of them. We have a responsibility to bring back home as many people as we can. And so if that takes another day, then we'll have to deal with the consequences. But that comes first. Flo Hassan Nahum, Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I'm joined now here on set by the director of the Palestinian Solidarity Campaign here in the UK, Ben Jamal. Ben, thanks so much for, for joining us. Do you, do you well, welcome this, this deal and the tentative way that it has begun today? Well, we welcome it. Um, we welcome the fact that there will be a respite for Palestinians uh, in Gaza, uh, a temporary respite from the bombardment. Uh, we welcome the release of hostages and we welcome the release of uh, Palestinians held in uh, detention by Israel, but it's obviously not sufficient. Um, Israel's making clear, I think you had an Israeli military spokesperson on yesterday indicating that even if all the hostages are released, Israel intends to continue with its military campaign. So without a full ceasefire, effectively what's been offered to Palestinians today uh, is a um, temporary reprieve a pause uh, in terms of a threat of further execution. And obviously what is also required is a real effort uh, to address the humanitarian crisis in Gaza, uh, which requires not just the amount of aid uh, that is going to go in under this deal, which is insufficient, but an actual real effort to begin the reconstruction of Gaza. 1.6 million people are displaced. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them living in tents as we approach winter, and over half the housing stock uh, in Gaza has been destroyed. So if all of that is going to be addressed, then we need a full ceasefire. Wh which I can totally understand is, in an ideal world, what, what basically everyone in the world would like to see. There's also a question of what's realistic. I mean, we've just seen the tentative way with, with which just temporary truce has started, and there was smoke. Uh, this morning, there was um, the sound of some rockets this morning that our Ali Bunker reported on. In that sense, I guess I just wonder whether y y you think the extended debate in this country over ceasefire versus pause was perhaps overdone and that we should take what we can get and, and build on that as opposed to criticise some progress, albeit small, that has been made. Well, I'd say two things. Look, first of all, one of the arguments used. Uh, by those who were saying they were not calling for a full ceasefire uh, was that it was impossible for something to be implemented because 
one could not negotiate with Hamas. Now, we've just seen a temporary pause introduced, uh, which has been agreed by both sides. It's actually a deal uh, that Hamas put on the table several weeks ago, and it's taken pressure on Israel, international pressure, to agree to this. But the second thing is, uh, is the implementation of international law. Now, um, that requires that Israel stops its bombardment of Gaza, stops its indiscriminate um, killing of civilians that so far has led uh, to the killing of more than 14,500 Palestinians, including over 6,000 children, and it needs to lift the siege. Uh, we have a situation at the moment where health authorities are warning about a major outbreak of epidemics. Uh, a temporary pause for four days, as welcome as it is, some aid going in uh, is welcome, but it's not sufficient to, protect, to prevent an imminent humanitarian catastrophe. I, I, just to round this off, are you blaming purely the Israeli side that there's not been more on this point? I mean, you suggest that Hamas offered precisely this already. We can't trust that that's definitely the case, that they would say that they're a terrorist um, organisation. They are still literally holding 150 hostages to ransom. Uh, I, I just wonder whether you accept this as both sides that, that are the reason we're not any further down the line. Well, what we require is the... Um, indiscriminate application of international law, and that is a responsibility on both sides. So all of the hostages should be released, but also Israel cannot use as a bargaining chip that it will bring in more aid or it will stop the indiscriminate bombing of civilians dependent on the release of hostages. The other thing that is worth saying, we need to address, if we're actually going to end this situation finally and achieve what everybody wants, uh, which is peace in the region, uh, then we need to deal with the root causes. And the root causes is the ongoing military occupation. One of the factors that people should be focusing attention on uh, in relation to the exchange of prisoners today is the fact that Israel holds over 8,000 Palestinians uh, in detention. 2,000 of those are held in what's called administered detention, which means they are held without charge, without trial. 200 of them are children. Uh, as young as 12. Israel is the only country in the world that, that systematically prosecutes children through military courts. Mm. That has been defined by the United Nations as a crime under international law, and Israel should release all of the prisoners who are held illegitimately as part of a tool of enforcing military occupation. So we have to deal with the root causes. This demands both sides respect international law. We're, we're out of time, but I'm sure as we leave very quickly you'll agree that taking hostages is not a legitimate way to, to try and rectify those, those situations. No, taking hostages is illegal under international law, as is the illegitimate detention that Israel is currently enacting on thousands of Palestinians. Benjamin, thank you. Thank you. Time for the sport. James has got it for us. And good morning to you. Um, Wilf will be very pleased. The Premier League is back. He's been talking to me about it all morning long. Not long to wait, Wilf. First game gets underway uh, tomorrow lunchtime. It will be a good one. Manchester City against Liverpool. But coming up in the sport, we'll tell you what upset Novak Djokovic in the Davis Cup tennis. Plus Sam Kerr striked a hat-trick for Emma Hayes' Chelsea side and got them a fantastic victory against Paris FC in the Champions League. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with Vitality. Welcome to the Roast Restaurant here in central London. We are lucky enough today to be joined by three elite athletes. Now they're going to be cooking a cultural dish all related to their heritage. It's going to be fun. Let's go see who they are. Right, we're very lucky we found a gap in the training schedule of a great British Olympic athlete. Lavia Nilsson joined us in the kitchen cooking for us today. What have you got for us, Lavia? So this is a traditional Sudanese dish, that's my mum's heritage. It's called mahshi in Arabic, but it's basically a stuffed vegetable dish. Uh, it's got rice and we're doing a vegan version today with some brown lentils instead of minced meat. So yeah, really excited about it. My sister and I, we, we learned from our mum, you know, the value of a home-cooked meal. And you're so growing up in your in your household, you said your mum was Sudanese and Egyptian, and your dad was from Denmark, right? So quite a multicultural household. Yeah, my mum, you know, she taught us 
She taught us to appreciate food from every culture, um, mainly Sudanese <laughs> food. Um, we never sat in front of the television. We always sat on a you know dining table, always talking about school and sport and everything like that. So, and the good thing about my heritage is that the Sudanese diet is kind of influenced by both African and sort of Mediterranean diet. And we all know Mediterranean diet is really good for you. So I always say like herbs can add a lot of flavour to your dish. So we're actually going to use lentils for this dish, which makes it completely vegan, which is great. We're also going to add our herbs at the same time. Get the flavour in there. Look at that, come on. And one last thing, the holy grail of black cooking, the Maggie Cube. <laughs> This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Uh, you're watching Sky News Breakfast. Lots more still to come. We'll be discussing Black Friday uh, next. Uh, where are the bargains? We'll have that for you. push the protesters further back here. There's around two or three hundred still remaining. I'm Dan Whitehead and I'm Sky News's West of England correspondent. This van goes onto the streets of Plymouth seven days a week, 365 days a year. These facilities at the moment are a lifesaver, it's all we've got. From fishing communities to bustling cities, we spend every day reporting from across the region, hearing from people who have real stories. I'm going to have nowhere to live for about three or four months. There are still people inside the properties here. They're coming from the epicenter of what is now a global health pandemic. seeing and speaking to young women who were selling themselves right on the high street. It was desperately sad and the fact it was happening right in the heart of this community. Before Brexit, these oysters were being exported to the EU, but the trade stopped overnight. What's your feeling about the future? Blake might all be finished, I don't know. Welcome back. It is uh, Black Friday. It's a chance to snatch a bargain or another cynical marketing ploy to get people spending. Well, either way, shoppers could see delays to their deliveries because uh, workers at Amazon are walking out today. Well, a little bit later, we'll be speaking to the head of the union involved uh, in that. But first, let's do the positive side of all of this. Uh, retail expert Kate Hardcastle is here. And Kate, it's interesting. Uh, first of all, the pause on the origins of Black Friday. Of course, it's the day after Thanksgiving in the US sort of the equivalent to British Boxing Day that, that we used to have. But is Black Friday now fully a global uh, shopping day, regardless of uh, whether you celebrate Thanksgiving or not? 
Well, it certainly made its impact here in the UK, even though we don't celebrate Thanksgiving traditionally. And it's a welcome uh, discount period, if you think about it, because traditionally we wouldn't have discounts at this time of year. Stores would be aiming to get full price in what we call the golden quarter, this period from September to December, where we normally enjoy good sales buoyancy in the stores. But of course, that changed in 2010 when Amazon brought over the Black Friday phenomena to UK. Other countries and areas have actually different shopping period, including Singles Day, which is hugely popular in Asia. But going back to Black Friday here, I think we've become used to it. I think it's part of the metric. But what shoppers are telling me is they've really noticed this is no longer a day. This is an event that's now a month long. Even Black Friday murmurs in October ha- happened because retailers have certainly felt the pinch this year. They know shoppers aren't really shopping the same way. They're watching their budgets. And there's almost this race to the finish line as we see retailers try to make sure they're going to get your spend mm. at this time of year. So it's a certainly a time to remember as buyers to be aware that maybe the prices aren't always the best but if you've budgeted and it's the right item for you certainly this year there are some genuine bargains to be had well i was going to ask that i mean if you're if you don't mind when you get the 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 product is it better still if you wait until boxing day or an altogether different day or or are these pretty much the cheapest days of the year for, for for certain types of spending This is certainly not the cheapest time of the year. In fact, which have come out with a report today to show that very few products are at their best price right now. So it's still always worth using for larger uh, priced items, things like shopping trackers. And you can watch the fall and rise of prices throughout the year. There's also a calendar for these things just to generally understand and try and work with. If you're buying um, something like garden furniture, don't buy it just as spring starting because that's when everyone wants it. Buy away from the tide of shopping habits. I think why we've seen some bargains this year that seem a bit more genuine is there's a lot of stock. We just know over the last few months, thanks to those ONS figures that show us just how much sales volume is going through and value, that we haven't had the same uh, urgency or interest in consumers buying. But that's not necessarily because they're not buying from anywhere. Certainly trends I've seen indicate that we've seen a lot more in what we call direct source, which would be the sites you might have heard of like Temu or Shein, where it's coming from a, a direct site internationally, or indeed re-commerce, which to you and I, we used to know as a second-hand market. And we've seen a lot of people generate their own income by being able to sell what's in their wardrobe, sell small electrical items for their home, try repurpose that and almost recycle it. Great for the environment and certainly great for people's wallet. Well, Kate, thank you so much for joining us and breaking it all down uh, for us. And uh, good luck shopping to all our viewers uh, if they <laughs> want to enjoy Black Friday. And a chance as well to say a belated happy Thanksgiving to any of our American viewers. Uh, time for a quick look at the, view- uh, the weather now. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. An increasingly northerly wind will make it colder for most this weekend, bringing extensive overnight frosts. Northern and eastern Britain are bright and quite cold, but as a raw wind has limited the frost. The weather, sponsored.
Hello, a very good morning to you. It is nine o'clock. This is Sky News Breakfast. An hours old truce is holding between Israel and Hamas. So what next? I'll be putting that question to security expert Robert Clark, who served in the British military. It is Friday, the 24th of November. Well, taking effect a day late, the pause in fighting falls over Gaza with no major reports of bombing, artillery strikes or rocket attacks. It promises some relief and more aid to 2.3 million Palestinians who've endured seven weeks of fighting. The priority will be getting as many hostages out as possible, but also getting humanitarian aid into Gaza. But Israel has warned that once the truce is over, the war will resume. Ireland's uh, police say radicalisation played a part in a night of rioting after a stabbing outside a school. We have not seen public order situation like this before. This may be um, behaviour which is apparent in other countries, but I think that we've seen an element of radicalisation. As pressure mounts on the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak over rising migration, a government minister tells me the record numbers must come down. We accept that these figures are too high. Nearly a decade after killing his girlfriend on Valentine's Day, former South African track champion Oscar Pistorius is taking another chance at early release from the prison behind me. Nissan is set to announce its commitment to making new electric car models in Sunderland, preserving thousands of jobs in the process. And in sports, Sam Kerr scores a brilliant hat-trick as Chelsea win in the Champions League group stages. And Great Britain have been knocked out of the Davis Cup tennis. They've been beaten in the quarterfinals by Novak Djokovic's Serbia. A very good morning to you. A temporary truce has come into effect in the Israel-Hamas war. It sets the stage for the exchange of hostages held in Gaza and Palestinians imprisoned in Israel. Uh, let's uh, go uh, live uh, in just a moment. Well, if it holds uh, for the four days as planned, it will be the first significant uh, break in fighting since Israel declared war on Hamas seven weeks ago in response to the group's uh, terrorist group's attacks on uh, October the 7th. Uh, let's go live now uh, to uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, Ahmed Lee's correspondent Alistair Bunkle is there for us. And uh, Alice, th the right question, it's probably going to be the right question each hour uh, all day, but is this truce still holding? Yes, it is, uh, but you are absolutely correct. It is only a few hours in and it is fragile. And hour by hour, um, Israelis and civilians in Gaza will just be hoping that it continues to hold. It's an initial four-day truce, during which time 50 Israeli hostages will be released from Gaza. Women and children, the first will come out this afternoon, all being well, at around four o'clock local time here. We think 13. Um, as I say, women and children, they'll come out through the sudden crossing into Egypt, where they'll be handed over from Hamas to the International Red Cross, and they'll travel a short distance to the Israeli border, where the Red Cross will then hand them over to Israeli military, and then taken from there to secure military facilities, where no doubt they will receive medical attention depending on their needs. And the Israelis have said that uh, they will assess the hostages' mental state but with the aim, of course, of debriefing them over the coming days and seeing what information they might be able to help with in terms of where other hostages are being held. Uh, Ali, I, I was struck on this day of uh, positive uh, movement, maybe not outright positivity, uh, by my two guests last hour, one from each side of this dispute, about the still total lack of trust, really, between the two sides. And, and I guess I, I, uh, I then wonder in your uh, perspective, your, your opinion, whether there really is hope for this to extend beyond the initial four days or even to make those initial four days. Well, I think trust will be built. I mean, there'll never be outright trust between Hamas and Israel, but trust will be built to an extent over the coming hours if uh, the uh, rules of the ceasefire are adhered to by both sides. So as soon as one side, if one side or the other, starts to maybe veer away from what was agreed, then that's where we enter dangerous territory in terms of the ceasefire being broken. But 
Every day that um, Hamas doesn't attack Israel and the Israeli forces in Gaza uh, don't attack Hamas, and every day that hostages are released and in turn the Israelis release Palestinian prisoners as part of the deal, then I think that trust will increase. And it might not be until we're a few days into this, if we get that far, that they can really start thinking about extending it a bit further because Israel has said that if Hamas comes up with more prisoners they can release and will offer to release, then for every 10 prisoners they would extend, the, sorry, hostages I should say, for every 10 hostages they would extend the ceasefire by a further 24 hours. So, of course, the hope in Israel is that the ceasefire is extended in order that more hostages are released. But the Israelis will be very cautious about Hamas's motives behind this because they will know that Hamas will try and use this as an opportunity to take a breather after what has been an intense seven weeks of uh, bombardment against them. But they'll use this as an opportunity as well to rearm because Israel has been very clear it is their objective to resume this war once the ceasefire is over. So Hamas will know that the fight is not finished. Ali Bunkle, as always, thanks so much. Uh, no doubt a busy and important day ahead. Uh, Ali Bunkle there in Tel Aviv. Now, buses and trams were torched and a shop looted last night in Dublin after a stabbing outside a school that left three children and a woman injured. Police say the events are unlike anything they've experienced and have blamed radicalisation for the incident. We have not seen public order situations like this before. This may be um, behaviour which is apparent in other countries, but I think that we've seen an element of radicalisation. Uh, well, we will have uh, Stephen Murphy uh, a little bit uh, later on to sum up uh, the, the mood there in uh, Dublin for us this morning. Now, a man has died after a confrontation with police in East London. The Met says officers were contacted by the man in Dagenham last night who said he was armed and threatening to take his own life. A negotiator tried to engage with the man before shots were fired by officers around 9pm. He died at the scene. The Independent Office of Police Conduct is investigating. The Work and Pension Secretary has told me this morning that figures showing a record peak in net migration are unacceptable. The revised figure was 745,000 in the year to December 2022. We recognise that there are different types of uh, immigration. Um, there is immigration, for example, 150,000 students bringing in dependents is an area where we have started to restrict that. And that will make a, a big difference, as indeed the OBR and others uh, recognise. But the, immig the immigration or migration that is not acceptable and is completely wrong is clearly the small boats coming across the short Dover Straits. And there we have uh, adopted a series of approaches greater cooperation with the French, a deal with Albania that's seen those numbers drop by 90%, such that we're actually a third down year on year in terms of the numbers coming across. Now, that's at the same time, Wilf, that across Europe, those numbers are going in exactly the opposite direction. In fact, in, uh, on average across Europe, they're about a third up, we are a third down. But there's more to do, and that's why things like the Rwanda policy and other approaches are so important. Well, speaking in the last hour, Labour Party Chair Annalise Dodds said government inaction has led to the record high figures. We are seeing, unfortunately, under the Conservatives, a complete lack of grip on this. The Conservatives have not taken the action that Labour's called for, for domestic skills, training, workforce planning. In fact, they've decided not to remove the 20% discount for those staff who come in from overseas on the shortage occupation scheme. They've not linked that to training either. So I'm afraid this really shows that very substantial failure of the Conservatives. Well, joining me here in studio, our political correspondent, Rob Powell. And Robert, it's, it's so interesting. I mean, clearly the current track record is the government's and the government's uh, to own uh, alone. But looking forward, uh, particularly on a week when we've just had the autumn statement and Rachel Reeves was here saying actually she supports the national insurance uh, contribution cut, it's interesting to see if there's much difference between what both parties are saying about whether they explicitly are setting a target to reduce these numbers and how they get, a, uh, get around it. They're kind of not committing in a similar fashion. Yeah, not for the first time. They're in quite a similar place when it comes to migration, legal migration we're mm -hmm. talking about now. They want the numbers to come down. They believe the issue 
is domestic labour shortages. Mel Stride talked about getting people back into work um, on long-term sickness benefits and, and people that are out of work um, and claiming other sorts of benefits. Annalise Dodds talked more about workforce strategy. I think the issue is both of those things, whilst... Yes, they do explain part of the reason why migration's gone up and why we have gaps in the labour market. They're quite long-term fixes, so it's going to take time for that to play into bringing the number of migration, legal migration flows down. What Robert Jemrick, the Immigration Minister, has been talking about and we understood has submitted to the Prime Minister are five fixes that might have more of an immediate impact. He's talking about things like stopping the ability of people coming into work in the care sector from bringing dependents in um, and raising the amount you need to earn to get a visa. The issue with those is that they may run into some other cabinet resistance. The health secretary may well point out that there are huge numbers of vacancies in the social care sector and in the health sector and that migrants are needed to fill those gaps. So the question is how do you bring the numbers down without exacerbating the various other problems in bits of government and bits of the country? On illegal migration, a bigger difference? Um, uh, yes, there is a bigger difference on that. Labour has committed to scrapping the Rwanda asylum scheme even if it is up and running and working, the government clearly believe that is a central part of how they will tackle it, although at the, at the moment it's still tied up in um, legal problems. For Labour, the focus for them in tackling illegal migration is all about focusing on criminal gangs. Um, and, I, and I think on that you will find that more of a, a sort of battle line in the run-up to the next mm -hmm. general election because the government are using their Rwanda policy to try and draw a clear line between them and Labour, um, whereas Labour are trying to use it to really bulk up their accusation that this is mm -hmm. just another policy that the Tories uh, can't put into action. Of course, num the government focuses on a lot. The numbers, as we've seen in the last couple of days, a lot smaller uh, yeah. for uh, small boat crossings than legal migration. Rob, great stuff. Thank you. Now, Nissan has announced it will commit to producing three new electric models of its best-selling cars at its plant in Sunderland, as well as building a new battery factory. Nissan will invest £1.2 billion into the Sunderland site and will be supported by a contribution from the government. In his autumn statement, uh, Chancellor Jeremy Hunt said £4.5 billion would be made available to support strategic manufacturing sectors such as the car industry. Nissan's commitment to its Sunderland plant is expected to help preserve 6,000 jobs at the factory. Well, Sky News business correspondent Paul Kelso is at the plant for us. Further investment from Nissan and the real story here this morning with I'm on the production line at the Sunderland plant. It's Britain's biggest ever car factory. These are Nissan Qashqai's, their left-hand drive. They're heading for the continent. A reminder, this plant makes cars that go all over Europe. The big story here is not just that there will be a commitment to make uh, the electric successes to this vehicle and the Nissan Juke. But there's a commitment this morning to build a third battery gigafactory that will provide the powertrains for these new vehicles. 18 months ago, Boris Johnson was here uh, to announce government support for Nissan's initial uh, gigafactory, big investment on this site. It's being built at the moment. There's already a smaller battery factory making batteries for the Nissan Leaf. They committed 18 months ago to one factory. Today, a second gigafactory, three in total. Uh, they haven't said where it will be built uh, or indeed who will build it, but the partner for the existing battery factories is Envision, a Chinese-owned company. Uh, the total investment, £1.2 billion, they say, extra. Now, rising to £2 billion in total in due course. The usual rule of thumb about government support is around 10%. So we can, uh, we can speculate that between £100 and £200 million of the funding that Jeremy Hunt announced in his autumn statement to help uh, the automotive industry with the energy transition to low carbon sources will be heading here. Uh, we uh, got some words from the Prime Minister this morning. He says it's a massive vote of confidence in the UK automotive industry. And he says Sunderland is now the Silicon Valley of EV production. Of course, this is the Prime Minister who a couple of months ago delayed the phasing out of petrol and diesel engines by five years to 2035. The automotive industry, largely including Nissan, ignored him. They're sticking to 2030 as their deadline. And those electric vehicles and the batteries will be made here and in the UK. Paul Kelso there uh, for us. Uh, time for some other news now. And the arduous process of forming a new government coalition is beginning today in the Netherlands after far-right populist Gert Wilders' shock victory. 
Well, with almost all votes counted, Mr. Wilders' party, uh, the Freedom, uh, Party for Freedom, excuse me, is uh, forecast to win 37 parliamentary seats. That's the highest of any of the parties, albeit from a total of 150. His election pledges uh, included calling a referendum on the Netherlands' EU membership and a halt on accepting any asylum seekers. China says no unusual or novel pathogens have been found among outbreaks of respiratory illness in the country's north. The government says data shared with the World Health Organization suggests the spike is linked to the lifting of COVID restrictions, as well as common bacterial infections that mainly affect children. A crane worker involved in the dramatic rescue of a man from a burning building in Reading has described the ordeal as a close call. Glenn Edwards manoeuvred a cage in place, allowing the man to escape smoke and flames billowing around him. A second man was also rescued. Both were treated in hospital for smoke inhalation. Now, the Royal College of Nursing says there's a growing mental health crisis among nurses, including staff who are expressing, expressing suicidal thoughts. Our correspondent, Shaman Freeman Powell, is here with this story. And Shaman, the, the increase uh, that we're talking about here is, is quite striking. It's a, it's a doubling of suicidal thoughts. It is, yeah. The RCN says that it's had almost a doubling in the number of calls, especially nurses saying that they have been experiencing suicidal thoughts. So we're talking about 176 members in the first 10 months of this year. That's compared to 89 cases in the first 10 months of last year. To put that into perspective, the RCN says that just last month in October, they received an equivalent of one uh, call per working day with people saying that they are also experiencing suicidal thoughts. So they are pretty stark figures that we're speaking about here. Earlier, we spoke to Stephen Jones, the interim head of nursing practice at the RCN. He said the, these figures should uh, act as a frightening wake-up call for the government. He points to the fact that uh, nursing staff are more likely likely to experience suicidal thoughts anyway due to the excessive workloads that they experience and the long working hours as well. But he says that the staffing shortage in the NHS is contributing to these pressures and of course the fact that millions of people across the country are also waiting on that backlog, the NHS backlog, for elective surgery. So he says that this is adding to the stress. He's asked for the government, the RCN has asked for the government to reinstate these mental health support hubs that were set up uh, during the COVID pandemic. The RCN claimed that many of these hubs had to close due to a lack of funding after the pandemic. However, the government, uh, a spokesperson for the Department for Health and Social Care, says that there are mental health support in place for nurses. And they also said that they are working to clear up the, the backlog that we referred to, as well as reinstating more nurses. They say around 50,000 by next year. Shamal, uh, great stuff. Thanks so much. Uh, now, if uh, you or anyone you know has been affected by issues like this, uh, do call the Samaritans, 116-123, or email joe at samaritans.org. Well, former Olympian Oscar Pistorius is up for early release, 10 years after being jailed for killing his girlfriend, Reva Steenkamp. Let's talk now to our Africa correspondent, Yusra el who's outside the maximum security prison where Pistorius uh, is being held. And... Uh, Yusra, th this was a, a scheduled uh, hearing to, to hear if he was going to get an early release. When might we hear the result? I mean, this was an impromptu hearing, I would say, Will, because we just heard about it at the start of the week and it was considered to be kind of a, a correction of the miscalculation made by the Court of Appeals around when he is eligible for release. So this hearing was kind of held as an acknowledgement of the fact that they made that mistake. And eight months ago, when we, were here for a sim when we were here for a similar hearing, they said he wasn't eligible. So today we are expecting a result. There is a, a, a real sense that potentially this could be the day that he's released. But we're also still kind of scarred from the last time and thinking that potentially there may be some sort of indis discrepancies. But at the moment, the hearing is underway. And we did hear last time that he is a model prisoner, that he's been partaking very enthusiastically with the rehabilitation programs. But we've also heard a victim impact statement uh, from June Steenkamp, Reva's mother, read out by a representative who's also lost his daughter uh, to a killing by her boyfriend. She was very moving and she did share that she doesn't feel like he has remorse and hopes that he's per been participating in rehabilitation enough to address the anger issues she believes he has and believes led to the killing of her daughter. Yusra, thanks so much for us there in Pretoria, outside uh, the prison where uh, Mr Pistorius has been held. 
Well, so to come uh, this morning here on Sky News Breakfast, we'll speak to the GMB union about their Black Friday strike with over a thousand Amazon workers walking out. And the wonky tree that locals in one Cambridgeshire town say is killing their Christmas cheer. It looks like a little bit of a drunk tree almost. We'll be right back. I'm Alex Crawford and I'm Sky's special correspondent based in Istanbul. This is going to be the biggest party Tripoli has ever seen. That's it, it, it got us then. There's a lot of action going on, a lot of hits in still. We aim to be the best and the most trusted place in news. This is the cocktail of drugs which the doctors at this hospital have been giving their coronavirus patients. Made for people who want clarity in an uncertain world. Mother Nature is, can be vicious, absolutely savage. The world's largest falls now down to a trickle in places. I can't imagine how much plastic is lying at the bottom of this huge lake. Whoa! <laughs> Close and personal with your owner. This is what makes the job so fantastic. A temporary truce in the Israel-Hamas war came into effect early this morning, setting the stage for the exchange of dozens of hostages held by militants in Gaza for Palestinians imprisoned in Israel. Joining me now is Robert Clark, Director of Defence and Security at the think tank Civitas. Robert, very good morning to you. Uh, thanks for joining us. How fragile do you think things are? I mean, they're incredibly fragile. Very vulnerable sort of stage. It's taken the last four or five weeks of the most intense diplomatic uh, diplomacy to try and get to this stage. Obviously, brokered through various regional partners and countries, not least Britain as well. And we can see that in effect now with the Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, in um, uh, sort of in uh, Israel and uh, uh, Palestinian territories over the next few days. Um, but the, the fragility of it is incredibly intense. So uh, if either of the two sides sort of like break the truce, if you like, um, then it just risks further escalation. And to be fair, we can already see so far unverified, but potential uh, breaks in the Hamas sort of truce on their end with uh, several suspected rocket attacks already around 15 to 30 minutes after the truce was um, announced. So it's incredibly fragile. Things do look OK so far for the, I think it's 1400 UK time for the first of the, the 13 Israelis to be released. Um, in, in terms of getting here, both that perhaps uh, uh, salvo that you mentioned uh, 10 or 15 minutes into it, but also the delay over the last 36 mm. hours, is, is that to be expected? Or, or when you've seen that over the last 
24 hours, was it making you think, gosh, this is all going to fall apart? That these sorts of delays, are they kind of normal? Um, I think everyone has been uh, quite weary that it could have broken down at any moment. So it is good to even get to this stage for the release of the Israeli hostages, the majority of which are obviously women and children uh, and babies. Um, in terms of the, uh, the, the nature of it to break down, um, it does look good so far in that sense. Um, but like I say, the, the fragility of it is, is incredible. Um, clearly, there was within the structure the ability for it to be extended. Mm. Um, do you think that's likely or do you think, in fact, Israel might have been pushed by some of its partners like the US to even agree to this in the first place and the best is, best we can hope for is a couple of days of this, this holding? To be perfectly honest, uh, it's difficult to speculate whether the extensions will be um, sort of enacted. So it's for every uh, 10 additional Israeli hostages an extra day of the, the so-called truce or ceasefire. Uh, in terms of partners trying to pressure Israel, it's in Israel's own interest to try and extend it, to try and get as many of their hostages out. Um, interestingly, it's actually Hamas who control uh, the cards and have the power in this. As long as they maintain uh, and control Israeli hostages, they can draw out the war, obviously. Um, they know they're on limited time because Israel will continue um, the intensity of the conflict that we've seen so far. So let's talk about the conflict and the, and the current situation. Is there an aspect to why Israel was willing to agree to the deal because of the progress they've made on, try, made on trying to eradicate Hamas, or, or do you not really think they've made that much progress? Um, I think they've made enormous progress, actually, to be fair. Um, we can see, for example, the, the scale of Hamas fighters that have been uh, published by the uh, Israeli Defense Forces who have been uh, taken out, neutralized, and arrested. Um, you know, this is quite impressive. They've maintained uh, quite an effective military operation within Gaza um, over the last sort of few weeks. Um, and the speculation that really this will carry on for around about another two months at least, um, ultimately to achieve the political desire, which is the military defeat of Hamas, which is wholly legitimate, and Israel are acting well within their grounds of self-defense to carry that on. Um, in these sorts of situations, a four-day pause, let's say it's, it, it holds that long but doesn't go longer, mm. is that a... a, a huge amount of time for Hamas to be able to regroup? Will it make a big difference to what they're able to show to resist Israel when the fighting restarts again? Uh, I mean, absolutely, it plays into Hamas's hands in terms of the four days. It's almost unprecedented in modern warfare. Um, I served in Iraq and Afghanistan, for, exa for example, and we've never had sort of multi-day pauses in fighting or uh, during intense fighting because precisely it gives the enemy which operate within the civilian infrastructure the ability to regroup, rearm uh, and coordinate more attacks. Um, so it's uh, to Israel's, um, it's to Israel's sort of, uh, not to their benefit, but it shows the extent to which they want to try and get these hostages back and also to allow the humanitarian aid to flow into Gaza. And that's a vulnerability as well. We talk about there's around 200 extra trucks are coming in each day for fuel and aid. Um, but ultimately that will help Hamas in the long run. When you were in Afghanistan and Iraq, were there pauses that you had to adhere to? Um, like I say, during intense uh, fighting during the campaigns, particularly in Afghanistan, um, there were no such like pauses uh, for humanitarian relief efforts. So like I say, this really is not, unprecedented. Not even very, very short ones, no. No, that's why I say this is unprecedented for a military to conduct these multi-day pauses uh, to allow humanitarian aid and the safe conditions for hostage release. What, and as a soldier, if, you, if that had been imposed on you, if you felt like you were making progress, if you'd been putting your life in danger, mm. um, as you, of course you, you were, what, what would have gone through your mind if you were told by the political leaders you had to stop? I mean, anyone who served in Iraq or Afghanistan, or particularly any professional military, uh, adheres to the rules and the laws with which they're bound by and with which the orders are set by their commanders. So um, the ability, and we can see this with Israel actually right now in Gaza, uh, the majority of Israeli forces have stayed in place um, precisely to uh, sort of prevent re-exploitation of the Hamas fighters and the terrorist fighters to sort of regroup and rearm directly uh, in front of them. So they'll be sort of keeping watch, surveilling for uh, increased enemy activity. But uh, by and large, the Israelis will absolutely be adhering to this process. They want to release, they want to see the release of their hostages more than anything. Robert Clark, as always, thanks so much for joining us. Much appreciated. By the way, 9 p.m. tonight, uh, a special program on the Israel Hamas war and the temporary truce that started just a few hours ago. Yalda will have all of that for you, 9 p.m. Time now uh, for a quick look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. An increasingly northerly wind uh, will make it colder for most this weekend, bringing extensive overnight frosts. Northern and eastern Britain are bright and quite cold now, but a raw wind has limited the frost. The southwest is milder, but much cloudier. I can assure you I haven't written this and put an 
the word frost in so many times. The morning will be quite sunny for most with a stiff northerly wind bringing gales and hail and snow and showers to exposed eastern coastal regions. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, Christmas trees are going up everywhere as we head into the festive season. Uh, but this one in the Cambridgeshire town uh, of March is causing more division than Christmas cheer. Locals were miffed about what they say is a wonky tree plonked down without much care. Others are comparing it to the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Volunteers who put it up say it was uh, like that when it arrived and the annual tree lighting will go ahead tonight because it's uh, uh, as straight as it's going to get. There we go. Surely with the Christmas cheer that should be uh, surrounding all things at this moment, that the wonkiness shouldn't overrule the sense, override the sense of Christmas cheer. A bit of lights. Put the lights on at an angle that will uh, uh, equal things out. Anyway, uh, we've got much more still to come uh, here on Sky News Breakfast. Not just wonky Christmas trees. Black Friday bargains abound, but Amazon workers are walking out. And we'll talk to the GMB union about that. Let's go live to listen to Ireland's Taoiseach, Leo Varadka, speaking outside Dublin Castle following a stabbing, stabbing that left three children and one woman injured yesterday in the subsequent significant riots and looting in Dublin overnight. A nation that is unsettled and afraid. This is not who we are, this is not who we want to be, and this is not who we will ever be. Yesterday afternoon, innocent children were attacked outside the Gael Kaloshta were in Dublin city centre. It was a horrifying act of violence, and our thoughts are with the injured children, their heroic care assistant who threw herself in harm's way to protect them, and with all those who risked their lives to save lives. They're real Irish heroes, whatever their nationality, Irish, British, and Italian. Our thoughts are also with the doctors and nurses in our city who are trying to save the lives of those who are injured. Many of them come from abroad. And our thoughts and prayers are with the nation united in shock. Yesterday evening, some people decided that the best way to respond to this terrible attack was to take to the streets of Dublin and try to terrify, 
intimidate, loot and destroy. Their first reaction to a five-year-old child being stabbed was to burn our city, attack its businesses and assault our Gardaí. As a result of their actions, buses and trams were set on fire, innocent passers-by were intimidated and pregnant women in Rotunda Hospital were made feel unsafe and in danger. These people claim to be defending Irish citizens, yet they put in danger the newest and most vulnerable and most innocent people. Those involved brought shame on Dublin, brought shame on Ireland, and brought shame on their families and themselves. These criminals did not do what they did because they love Ireland. They did not do what they did because they wanted to protect Irish people. They did not do it out of any sense of patriotism, however warped. They did so because they're filled with hate. They love violence, they love chaos, and they love causing pain to others. Looting a shop was more important to them than protecting the lives of our children, and they disrupted a guard investigation that was underway. The Guardi gained control of our streets last night within a few hours, and I want to thank them for that and for the risks that the date took. I want to pay tribute to our Guardi particularly those who answered the call from all over the country who came to Dublin within a few hours. As a country, we need to reclaim Ireland. We need to take it away from the cowards who hide behind masks and try to terrify us with their violence. We need to reclaim Ireland from the unscrupulous who prey on the fears of those easily led into darkness. And we need to reclaim Ireland from the criminals who seek any excuse to unleash horror on our streets. This morning as Taoiseach, I promise we will use the full resources of the law, the full machinery of the state, to punish those involved in yesterday's grotesque events, and will put in place measures to ensure that any repeat attempts will meet the full measure of the law. I spoke with the Minister for Justice and the Garda Commissioner last night, and met the Garda Commissioner this morning. We have sufficient Gardaí, and there are more in training. We have sufficient equipment and there is more on the way. We have strong laws, and the Garda Commissioner is free to use the Public Order Act over the weekend, as is required. We will pass new laws in the coming weeks to enable the Gardaí to make better use of the CCT evidence they collected yesterday. And also, we will modernise our laws against incitement to hatred and hatred in general. And that is more required than ever was the case before. And we will do that in weeks as well. To all those cowardly champions of Ireland who took to the streets of Dublin last night, let me say one thing. Ask your sisters, ask your friends, ask everyone you know what they fear most on our streets. They're afraid of you, afraid of your anger and your rage, afraid of your violence, your hate, and how you blame others for your problems. As a government, we will be relentless in protecting our citizens and defending our people. The Guardi will be on the streets in large numbers and will do whatever it takes to fight back waves of ignorance and criminality. The Minister for Justice will coordinate with the Commissioner to ensure we never witness such terrible scenes as the 23rd of November 2023 ever again. Being Irish means more than saluting the tricolour, beating your chest and pointing to where you were born. It means living up to the ideals represented by our flag. It means being true to our own history, and it means acting with compassion for others. And today I call on us all to remember who we really are, because we're better than this, and it's time we came together and reminded others who claim to speak for us about what our country really stands for. Thank you. Taoiseach, do you have confidence in the Garda Commissioner following the events of last night? Were the Garda adequately prepared? Uh, can you give us an update on the condition of the children um, involved in that stabbing attack yesterday? Uh, and then separately, just in relation to today's uh, conference, uh, what is the focus of it for you? Yeah, we have, um, I, I, have, I have total confidence in Commissioner Harris and I have total confidence in the Garda. Uh, they had an extremely difficult job to do last night and they did it. Uh, they contained uh, the riot. Um, they brought the city back under control within a matter of hours, and Gardaí travelled from all over the country. A call was put out to Gardaí who have riot training uh, to come in from all over the country. Uh, as Gardaí fighting back these thugs got tired, 
um, or got injured, uh, they had other guards behind them to replace them and to fill their shoes. And I think, obviously, we'll have to do a review as, as, as to what happened yesterday and all of the events leading up to us. But certainly over the next couple of days and couple of weeks, we need to be 100% behind the Gardaí. Uh, there should be no criticism of the Gardaí, only support, total support for the Gardaí and the Commissioner. So, sorry, so in relation to, 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 the, to the injuries, um, we, we, we have some details, as you know, five, five were injured, uh, two in a critical condition uh, still, uh, both the uh, five-year-old girl who was stabbed in the chest and also um, the care assistant who uh, shielded, um, who used her body as a shield to, to prevent other children from being, being injured. Um, so that they're both, both in a critical condition. Um, and. Um, um, the person who carried out this attack was, 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 attempt, was intent on murder, uh, that is clear. Um, we don't know his motivations. Um, the Gardaí have identified his dwelling, uh, have his computer, have his phone, will be able to uh, assess that in the coming days. Um, so I don't want to speculate on motivations at this stage, but absolutely nothing is ruled out uh, in, in that regard. I, I really want to thank the uh, people on the street who intervened. Um, it's hard to believe that this could have been worse, but this could have been worse had they not done so. And let's not forget that those, those who intervened um, were, weren't just from Ireland, they were from other countries as well. Okay, um, I suppose just to follow on from that, you said you were having conversations with Garda Commissioner Drew Harris. What did you say to him in those conversations? Were you satisfied with the policing response yesterday? You're saying there should be no criticism of the Gardaí. I mean, obviously, you know, we saw trams, buses being set on fire, um, shops being broken into. Are you satisfied with the policing response? And also, do you have confidence in your own Justice Minister, Helen McEntee? Yes, I do. Um, Minister McEntee and I and, and the Garda Commissioner um, were in contact uh, over the course of yesterday evening. Uh, we had to end the events here in the castle early for obvious reasons. Um, decisions were, were made to prioritise the security response. Um, what, I know people have asked the question about having a cabinet meeting. It wouldn't have been appropriate to use Garda resources last night to be protecting a cabinet meeting and, and all of us. Uh, so all the resources were dedicated to um, bringing uh, the violence under control. Uh, and I was in contact with the Tawnish and Mr Ryan, um, Mr McEntee and the Garda Commissioner throughout the course of the evening. Um, and everything last night was about bringing the situation under control, uh, containing the violence to a number of streets, uh, and then bringing the city under control, and it was under control by midnight. Uh, this morning has been different. Uh, this morning is about um, the clean-up uh, and uh, the response going forward. Uh, there were over 30 arrests. Uh, many of them will be in court uh, this morning, um, but obviously uh, more work is going to need to be done uh, over the next couple of days, both in, in relation to the uh, original attack and then also the uh, follow-on violence that, that occurred. But what are you saying to Drew Harrison? Are you happy with the police response? Yeah, look, I, I am happy with the policing response. Um, uh, we haven't had a riot of this nature or this kind of violence in our streets uh, in decades. And I think in the circumstances, uh, the Guardi responded promptly and responded quickly. Uh, roughly 500 people, we believe, were involved in these events. Um, within the space of uh, an hour, an hour and a half, there were 400 uh, Guardi on the streets uh, with riot gear and equipment. Uh, they responded extremely quickly um, and were able to contain it uh, to a small part of the north inner city and then bring it under control before midnight. Um, we will, of course, uh, carry out a full review of the events and find out what can be done better. Um, but I don't want there to be any ambiguity about this. Um, the people who caused this and who are to blame for this are those who engaged in the violence and rioting. It's the Gardaí that brought it under control, and we have to support them 100%, and I do. Okay, Adam Higgins, then Taoiseach, you mentioned in your opening statement that uh, the Commissioner can use the Public Order Act over the weekend. Are there concerns that there could be further incidents this weekend in Dublin? We're operating on the basis that there could be. Um, there are protests being organised uh, online at the moment, um, uh, in a similar to way as other protests have been, have been um, uh, organised online. Uh, so uh, the Guard Commissioner and the Guardi are, are operating on the basis that there could be a recurrence of these events uh, over the course of the weekend or into the future. Um, we have very strong legislation, uh, both in the Public Order Act and the Offences Against the State Act, um, the Commissioner has uh, the power under the Public Order Act uh, to prescribe or limit um, 
manifestations or protests as needed. Uh, and he will use those powers, but only if they're needed. Um, we will also, we're also bringing through legislation at the moment uh, around the use of CCTV. Uh, the Guardian collected a huge amount of CCTV evidence last night. We have a lot of CCTV in the city centre, uh, and it's important that we're able to use modern technologies to go through that and go through it quickly. Uh, so we're going to make sure that we make those changes to our laws uh, in the next couple of weeks to allow the Gardaí uh, to use that evidence and go through that evidence uh, and identify the people who are involved in these actions, and we are going to get them. Uh, in addition to that, I think it's now very obvious to anyone who might have doubted it um, that our incitement hatred legislation is just not up to date. It's not up to date for the social media age uh, and we need that legislation through and we need it through within a matter of weeks um, because it's not just the platforms who have a responsibility here and they do. Uh, there's also the individuals uh, who post messages and images online uh, that stir up hatred and violence uh, and we need to be able to use laws to go after them individually as well. The Irish uh, Taoiseach there, Leo Varadka, responding to the situation overnight and yesterday afternoon in Dublin in particular. He said how innocent children had been attacked yesterday. That, uh, of course, was the original stabbing. And then referring to the violence that broke out in Dublin overnight as a result, he said, uh, people decided the best way to respond was violence and intimidation. He said these people claim to be defending Irish citizens, but they instead brought shame on Dublin, on Ireland, on their family and themselves. And they did it because they were filled with hate and they love violence, not uh, out of any sense uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, celebrating their country. Uh, he said that uh, we need to reclaim Ireland from the cowards that hide uh, behind masks. He did also say he had full confidence in his interior minister and in the Garda commissioner, who we heard from. Uh, earlier in the day. Now, millions uh, will be browsing Amazon today for uh, Black Friday bargains, but can customers expect delivery delays as uh, more than a 1,000 Amazon workers stage a strike today? Amazon says they won't be affected and insists its paying conditions are fair. Uh, Stuart Richards from the GMB union joins me now from uh, Coventry. Uh, thanks so much for, for joining us, uh, Stuart. Uh, remind us exactly why your, your workers uh, are striking. They were offered some level of pay rise last month, but uh, not sufficient. Is that right? Absolutely right. We're coming close to a, a year of disputes at Amazon Coventry now, and the workers are striking purely over pay. Uh, during that time, they've secured a bonus payment and four increases, small increases, but it's still nowhere near enough. Uh, we're still uh, below what they were earning in 2018 in terms of inflation. So for a company that earns huge amounts of money, it's not too much to ask that they pay their workers a wage that they can actually live on, feed their families and heat their homes. On the, on the 27th of October, uh, an Amazon spokesperson said, we offer great pay and benefits and provide a modern and safe working environment. Do, do you and your members refute that? I think it's, it's amazing how Amazon's PR is, is just incredibly tone deaf. We've got 1,100 workers here at Coventry that are so upset that they're actually taking strike action. And to turn around to them and say, actually, your pay is brilliant is just incredibly stupid thing to do. The fact is that these workers are telling Amazon that their pay is not sufficient enough. They're saying that they are so angry about it that they're taking strike action. All that they accept is not bland PR statements they want their bosses to sit down, talk to them, talk to GMB Union and actually try and try resolve this dispute. And, and unfortunately, that's not happened yet. And uh, I, I believe the offer you got was an increase of at least one pound extra per hour. So the range is then £11.80 to £12.50, a reminder for people that the national living wage, wage was increased uh, to 11.44 earlier this week. What, what, what scale of increase would be sufficient, do you think? The workers here are, are asking for a, a wage of £15 an hour. Um, back in 2018, Amazon were trying to union bust in America and was saying that their average wage there was $15 an hour. That was way ahead of even what these workers are being paid now. In America, the wage is $20.50. Unfortunately, UK workers are the poor relations of Amazon. They want a decent wage. They want a share of those profits that they're making for this company. The, the organisation that sits right next to Amazon here pays £15 an hour and our members cannot see why they aren't able to access that kind of benefit. Stuart Richards, thanks so much for joining us. Very much appreciated. Thank you.
We are going to have the sport now with James. Yeah, coming up on the sports, uh, we'll tell you why it was a good night for Sam Kerr and Chelsea women in the Champions League. Plus, I'll tell you exactly what happened with Novak Djokovic at the Davis Cup. He wasn't too impressed with the Great Britain fans. All that's come in the spot. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with Vitality. Welcome to the Roast Restaurant here in central London. We are lucky enough today to be joined by three elite athletes. Now they're going to be cooking a cultural dish all related to their heritage. It's going to be fun. Let's go see who they are. Right, we're very lucky. We've found a gap in the training schedule of a great British Olympic athlete. Lavia Nilsson's joined us in the kitchen, cooking for us today. What have you got for us, Lavia? So this is a traditional Sudanese dish. That's my mum's heritage. It's called mahshi in Arabic, but it's basically a stuffed vegetable dish. Uh, it's got rice, and we're doing a vegan version today with some brown lentils instead of minced meat. So yeah, really excited about it. My sister and I, we, we learned from our mum, you know, the value of a home-cooked meal. And you're... So growing up in your, in your household, you said your mum was Sudanese and Egyptian and your dad was from Denmark, right? So a, quite a multicultural household. Yeah, my mum, you know, she taught us, she taught us to appreciate food from every culture, um, mainly Sudanese <laughs> food. Um, we never sat in front of the television. We always sat on a, you know, a dining table, always talking about school and sport and everything like that. So. And the good thing about my heritage is that the Sudanese diet is kind of influenced by both African and sort of Mediterranean diet. And we all know Mediterranean diet is really good for you. So I always say like herbs can add a lot of flavour to your dish. So we're actually going to use lentils for this dish, which makes it completely vegan, which is great. We're also going to add our herbs at the same time. Get the flavour in there. Look at that, come on. And one last thing, the holy grail of black cooking, the Maggi Cube. <laughs> Go add that for flavour. Because the herbs already add a lot of flavour, we don't need to add too much seasoning. So, have you got a bit of time off at the moment? Like I said, we're very lucky to sort of catch you in this uh, break that you have in training. What do you get up to when, you, when you've got that bit of time off to, to, to sort of down tools? I think, you know, because I travel so much for work, like you mentioned, I don't really get to see my friends and family that often. You're getting emotional. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. James, uh, thanks there for the sport. Now, radio stations and high street shops are already awash with Christmas songs, but putting Mariah Carey and Wham! hits aside, what about popsicles? Let's have a listen. Well, popsicles is a, a genre that's gained uh, pianist Chloe Flower worldwide recognition, and she joins me now. And Chloe, we just described this as a, an, almost as an official genre. Is it an official genre? It's more a word you've coined. I mean, listen, it's for the people, yeah. so it's, uh, it's for everyone. <laughs> maybe it's increasingly becoming official as, uh, as uh, your songs do better and better. And just describe what is it. So you, you're trained historically in classical music, but you're, you're trying to adapt that a little bit. Yeah, you know, I love popular music and I love classical music. I'm, I'm both things. So I just decided pop plus classical, popsicle. And do, do, does Christmas provide a great opportunity for that, where, where the two actually do overlap a bit more than, than other parts of the year? Yeah, I think definitely, um, you know, uh, Christmas has so many iconic and recognizable melodies. And so it's much easier, you know, than creating something original, right? If someone already recognizes the piece, whereas in classical music, you know, people often gravitate towards Moonlight Sonata and Claire de Lune, but there's so much classical repertoire. But, you know, in Christmas music, you have a, a more limited um, supply of, of themes. Well, and hopefully you reinvent them a little bit, because yes. as much as I love Christmas music, sometimes the same songs come back on and, and by about the 3rd of December, you've heard enough of them. So, so talk us through, you, you've got a Christmas uh, album that you've just released, Chloe Hart's Christmas. 
And I'm looking at some of the, the, the song titles. Some of them are classics, but have, have you given them a, a new modern spin on them and somewhat? Yeah, definitely. You know, I'm so inspired by old Hollywood and, um, you know, cinema music. And so I wanted to create a sound where, you know, if you listen to the radio and you hear my music, you'll be like, oh, that sounds like Chloe Flower. So it definitely has my own spin and my own personality. And uh, talk us through the, the kind of process to get here. Is, is the Christmas album something you hope will kick it into a, a new gear? I mean, you've already gained a lot of notoriety over the last couple of years performing at uh, various big events with, with the likes of, uh, of Cardi B at the Grammys and, and other moments. Yeah, you know, I think Christmas is my favorite holiday. And so it really made sense for me authentically to create uh, an album around Christmas. You know, for me, it's my favorite holiday because everyone's just a little bit kinder, a little bit nicer. And, um, you know, I wanted to create that into a sound. So basically, I want my Christmas album to feel and sound like a warm hug. They're, they're all a bit happier unless their Christmas tree is wonky. If you weren't watching the whole of the three-hour show, you won't know exactly what I'm uh, what I'm referring to. Finally, so the, the album is out. All the singles out as well. It's it's fully yes, available. Everything is out and available on all streaming platforms. I'm so excited. Well, Chloe, thank you very much. A very merry Christmas to you. Thank and you. Uh, Chloe Hart's uh, Christmas is out now. Chloe Flack, thanks thank so much you. for uh, joining us. Much thank appreciated. You.